This is the assembly plant for the Airbus A320. After the Boeing 737, it's the most popular jet plane ever built. Almost 2,000 of them are flying for airlines around the globe. It's safe and dependable, the airline equivalent of a minivan. The aluminium skin on the top of an A320 is less than two millimeters thick, about as thick as a coin. But this slender piece of metal helps keep passengers alive. Because the skies aren't nearly as friendly as they seem. Most people take aviation absolutely for granted. The difference between being on a commercial airliner at 35,000 feet and being in a space capsule in orbit is really not all that different. They're both life support systems. The reality is it's a hostile environment. The reality is it's 50 degrees below zero outside. The reality is that jet stream or that air stream out there would kill you almost immediately. It's not natural for people to travel through this killer atmosphere. But every day, millions of us fly easily some 3,000 meters higher than the top of Mount Everest. All our life support that's natural for us is down here at the bottom of this sea of air. And if we swim up too high, however we get there, if we're not protected, we can't live. But taking oxygen with us up to 11,000 meters is potentially dangerous. The air inside an airplane is pressurized, so passengers can breathe easily. As planes climb, the pressure outside decreases. The tightly packed air in the cabin begins exerting tremendous pressure on the fuselage. On an average jetliner, it means that every square meter of the fuselage must support more than 5,000 kilograms of force. And on almost every flight, the fuselage wins the battle. But only because airplane designers have learned tragic lessons. We have concentrated in the past on changing things, but unfortunately we wait until we have enough bodies. In the 1950s, a series of shocking accidents triggered changes that are still seen today. The comet has blazed new trails, achieving new speeds, setting a new standard. The passenger jet era began in the 1950s with the introduction of the de Havilland Comet. For the first time, jet engines were being used to push commercial planes higher than ever before. What Great Britain had at stake with the Comet was enormous. They wanted to really declare their place in civil aviation by having the first successful uh, jet transport aircraft. But less than two years after its maiden flight, the glittering jewel of British aviation disintegrated in mid-air. It would have been horrible. It would have been a horrible situation, but mercifully it would have been quick. What they had found with the bodies that they had recovered was the massive decompression, of course, caused the air inside your lungs to burst your lungs. At the same time, the outrush of air would tear you from your seat, and that many of these people would actually smash their heads against the structure. Three months later, another comet ripped apart in flight. Officials feared that every single comet could be a flying time bomb. The entire fleet is grounded. The design of the comet was actually a very sound design. There was only one thing that they didn't do, and it's because nobody knew. Unknown to engineers, there was a deadly flaw in the comet's basic design. To find the jet's fatal weakness, investigators built a massive water tank. They immersed a stripped-down comet. The pressure in the tank was increased and decreased, simulating the strains of flight. 
The experiment ran 24 hours a day, seven days a week. After the equivalent of some 3,000 flights, the comet's Achilles heel revealed itself, its square windows. You have a rapid change of direction in the shape, essentially a corner, uh, you have a high stress concentration. It gave rise to a fatigue crack, which then traveled rapidly through the rest of the structure, causing a massive decompression. The most advanced passenger jet in the world had succumbed to metal fatigue. The fuselage simply could not handle the force of the air inside, pressing out. The airplane, with all that force behind it, suddenly unzipped itself. Every plane that's built today is safer because of the disaster that struck the comet. Like other passenger planes, the windows on the A320 are rounded so that pressure doesn't build up around the corners. Perhaps even more importantly, extra rivets reinforce the skin of today's planes to contain cracks that might start anywhere on the fuselage. It's designed to go to that first row of rivets and absolutely be stopped. It's a healthy structure. It can never unzip itself. But 34 years after the comet crash, aircraft manufacturers were faced with another tragic disaster. The extra rivets that were supposed to save lives failed to withstand the relentless power of air pressure on metal. One of the fellows that I knew at the FAA, he said, you know, the day after this accident, I had to throw away most of what I knew about metallurgy and start over. At this Airbus factory in Toulouse, France, A320s roll out at about the rate of one every working day. Titanium rivets, lightweight and extremely tough, hold the fuselage together. 3,000 are used to join the separate sections. Another 3,000 can be found on each wing. Without them, the fuselage couldn't contain the pressurized air that's forced inside during flight. But even these rivets aren't foolproof. April the 28th, 1988. Aloha Airlines Flight 243 is traveling from Hilo Airport on the Big Island to Honolulu. With this island hop, Aloha 243 is making its ninth flight of the day, a normal schedule for the planes of Aloha. Protected within the jet, passengers give little thought to the fact that the cabin is filled with pressurized oxygen. It's constantly pushing against the fuselage, trying to escape into the surrounding atmosphere. In the cabin, the pressure is kept at a constant level, so passengers feel like they've never left the ground. But as a plane rises to its cruising altitude, the air pressure outside the cabin is dangerously low. Well, what we do is uh, extract uh, air from the engines and use that to pressurize the airplane. And what we can do then is control the pressure inside by a series of valves. The air moving through the cabin creates constant pressure on the jet's fuselage, keeping it inflated like a balloon. Every modern jet is built to withstand this pressure. There's an internal structure to a modern all-metal airplane. The skin without the structure would collapse easily. It would buckle easily. It'd be sort of like a, you know, a paper bag. Without, the, um, without any structure inside to hold it. If you remove the skin of a passenger jet, you'll find hoop-shaped bulkheads and formers supporting the width of the aircraft. Stringers run the length of the plane. They all help support the fuselage. And the cabin needs all the help it can get because as the plane gains altitude, that pressurized oxygen inside the plane is pushing against every square centimeter. On this day in April 1988, passengers are about to learn what happens when that air suddenly escapes. I saw a 
brilliant flash of light and boom. Everything was going, was being sucked out of the plane. Aloha Airlines 243 has just suffered what experts call an explosive decompression. The air inside the plane that makes jet flight possible escapes in a sudden horrifying moment. 35 square meters of the fuselage are gone. Just imagine the scene up there. The top of the airplane broken off. You now have 300 mile an hour winds blowing into that cabin. That's three times hurricane force winds. Those people were dressed for Hawaii in the springtime, not minus 50 degree temperatures. Any period of time at 24,000 feet, and those people will die. What the fuck's that? You have to get down! Captain Bob Schornsteimer begins an emergency descent, dropping 20 meters a second. The stress on the damaged craft threatens to tear it apart. A woman that was sitting next to me and her husband, he was on the other side in the next row up. She was next to me and they were reaching their hands out and they were trying to touch fingers to say goodbye. Against incredible odds, the flight crew land their bruised and battered airplane. Even with this explosive decompression, there's only one death on Aloha Flight 243, a flight attendant who was pulled out of the plane. Jim Wildey investigates the crash for the National Transportation Safety Board. In his laboratory, Wildey makes a disturbing discovery. Running through some of the pieces of the plane's fuselage, he finds a series of hairline cracks. They're right beside the holes created by rivets and barely visible to the naked eye. But they're classic signs of metal fatigue. Metal fatigue is uh, something that sounds exotic, but it really is easy to understand. Any piece of metal has a certain breaking point. All of us have tried to open a tin can and not quite gotten the opener all the way around. We work it back and forth until that last portion breaks. You just demonstrated metal fatigue. A plane isn't a rock-solid tube. To maintain the pressure passengers need to enjoy a flight, it's designed to be much more flexible. The fuselage of the airplane is actually breathing. It expands and contracts depending on altitude. When it's on the ground, it's in a contracted status. When it's at altitude, 24,000 feet, the fuselage expands. If you could stand at the back of a 250-foot-long uh, jetliner and just sight along that fuselage, you'd see it begin to puff up a little bit. And as a plane lands, the pressure differential between the inside and the outside of the plane disappears. The fuselage returns to normal. So the airplane is constantly cycling. That's pressurization. That will weaken the structure over a long period of time. Records show that the Aloha jet was 19 years old. 737s are designed for a 20-year service life and are recommended 75,000 flights. But as investigators take a closer look, they discover that the Aloha jet had logged an astonishing 89,000 separate flights. The short hops between the Hawaiian Islands meant that the planes in the Aloha fleet went through more pressurization cycles than any other aircraft. You saw something as you got on this airplane. What did you see? Investigator Jim Wildey gets a lead when he interviews one of the Aloha passengers. She says she saw a small crack in the fuselage just to the right of the door. The witness saw cracking in this area, and we found fatigue cracking back in here. So this is the line where the fatigue cracking joined up. One piece came down this way and folded off, and the other piece went across the top and came off to the right side. But something doesn't make sense. The Aloha jet lost 35 square meters of its fuselage. In the years after the Comet disaster, Boeing and other companies had designed a safety feature that should have kept any tearing to an absolute minimum. Inside the fuselage of every 737, Boeing has installed a series of tear straps. If any kind of tear develops in the fuselage, it should only run as far as the next tear strap, never more than 13 centimeters away, before shooting off at a 90 degree angle. This would have prevented the sort of catastrophic disintegration that ripped apart the comet. The purpose of the tear strip is to confine any kind of rip or tear in the fuselage skin to a 10 inch square, basically. 
The 10 inch square allows a controlled decompression and confines any structural damage to a very small area. But for Aloha 243, the tear straps did not contain the rupture caused by the metal fatigue. The NTSB believes there were so many cracks in the fuselage that they eventually joined together, tearing an enormous hole in the plane. But jets aren't held together by rivets alone. The comet disaster had also highlighted the need to reinforce the fuselage. The skin of an airplane is built from separate panels, which overlap. These panels are bonded together by a powerful adhesive known as epoxy. As the epoxy hardens, the panels are locked together by rivets. And during his investigation on the Aloha fuselage, Jim Wildey finds discoloration inside some of the overlapping joints. You can see now where the dark material is the epoxy that was used to bond the two layers of the lap joint together. The white material you see here is corrosion damage of the aluminum fuselage skin. The Hawaiian climate is great for tourists, but it's tough on airplanes. The ocean air is humid and heavy with salt. It can corrode even industrial epoxy. Investigators learned that Boeing, the company that built Aloha 243, had issued numerous written warnings about the epoxy. If it isn't applied at the right temperature, if the panels have moisture or dirt on them, the bonding can fail. Boeing recommended regular detailed inspections, but workers at Aloha didn't report any problems with the epoxy. They either never saw the compromised epoxy, or if they did, it wasn't repaired. The stress that's trying to pull one skin away from the other skin piece, the stresses would go through the bonding and not through the rivets. Of course, as this thing becomes disbonded, now the rivets themselves are loaded, and especially this top row of rivets, and this is the row of rivets we think that had the fatigue cracking in it. These cracks go unrepaired, and now you have an airplane that is a ticking time bomb. The fuselage on Aloha 243 was seriously compromised by several factors. Poor maintenance, the age of the aircraft, and by the heavy tours of duty. Since 1988, we have come light years in understanding this, and we no longer leave ourselves the tolerance that used to be left to airlines to just go out and take a look at the airplane and sign it off. The Aloha accident was another step towards making passenger jets safer. It's important to always learn from your mistakes. It's important to learn lessons from that. And uh, that has been the case with aeronautical engineering. The Aloha story was a brutal lesson in the dangers of metal fatigue. But it wasn't the last example of the power of cabin pressure. Two years later, the industry would get another terrifying reminder. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. My name is Tim Lancaster. Welcome aboard this British Airways flight to Malaga. June the 10th, 1990. British Airways flight 5390 is leaving Birmingham, England for Spain. 87 people are on board. 80 knots. Two minutes into the climb, the flight crew switch on the autopilot. Captain Tim Lancaster takes off his shoulder straps. Now I went into the flight deck to ask uh, Tim and Alistair what they would like to drink. You gentlemen, like a tea? Please, the usual. Minutes later, at 5,200 meters, the plane is very close to its assigned altitude. And then, like a cork out of a champagne bottle, the windshield bursts from its frame. <laughs> Captain Tim Lancaster is sucked out of his seat and is pinned to the fuselage by blistering winds roaring close to 550 kilometers an hour. The temperature is minus 17 degrees centigrade and there's very little oxygen. Co-pilot Alistair Atchison is alone at the controls. 
Ordinarily, cockpit windows cannot budge from their frames. The force of the air as the plane soars through the sky pushes the windshield onto the plane. But on flight 5390, something has gone terribly wrong. Flight attendant Nigel Ogden rushes in to help. And I looked in, the flight deck door was resting on the controls, and all I could see was Tim out the window. I just grabbed him before he went out completely. Other flight attendants do what they can. Co-pilot Alistair Acheson reduces speed and descends quickly. But as he slows the plane down, the drop in wind pressure lets the captain slide around on the side of the plane. All I remember is Tim's arms flailing out. His arms seemed about six foot long. And he's, I'll never forget that. His eyes were wide open. I mean, his face was hitting the side of the side screen. But he didn't blink. And I, I, I thought to myself, and I said to John, I said, I, th I think he's dead. I think he's dead. Just 35 minutes after taking off, Acheson gets his jet safely back on the ground. But the most unbelievable chapter of this entire story is the fact that Captain Tim Lancaster survives his incredible ordeal. But I remember watching the windscreen move away from the aircraft, and then it had gone like a bullet. It disappeared into the, into the distance. And I was very conscious of going upwards. And, uh, well, the whole thing became completely surreal then, as it would. And uh, I was aware of being outside of the aeroplane, I can remember seeing the tail of the aircraft, I can remember the engines going round, and, uh, and then I don't remember much more. Tim Lancaster was pinned to the outside of the plane for over 20 minutes. His injuries were surprisingly minor. Bone fractures in his right arm and wrist, frostbite and shock. Within five months, Tim Lancaster was flying again. In the immediate aftermath, investigators have very little to go on. The windscreen was missing. There was a certain amount of blood around. There were some minor dents and scrapes on the fuselage, as you'd expect if the window had gone past. And really, that was about it, apart from a lot of paper scattered around inside. The maintenance log is recovered from the plane. Stuart Culling learns the windscreen had been replaced just hours before takeoff. Everything OK? Fine. She's just come out of maintenance by the look of it. Nothing much, though. Just changed the windscreen. I wanted to find out exactly what had happened to the aircraft before it took off. Early in the investigation, the missing windscreen is found. It contains a curious piece of evidence. There were something like 30 bolts found with it, most of which were one size short in diameter, one size too small in diameter. On many planes, windscreens are fitted from inside the cockpit. Internal cabin pressure pushes against them, keeping them in place. But on the BAC-111, the windscreen is bolted from the outside. The pressurized oxygen inside the jet pushes out against the windscreen. The bolts must resist this pressure. There are enough of them there that they simply can't pull out of the structure. But of course, if you then violate the very premise of that by putting the wrong bolts on, all bets are off. You're now a test pilot. He's, he's, During his interview with the ground shot. engineer who repaired the plane, Absolutely. Culling gets a major break. One thing that came out was that he said, oh, the old bolts went into a waste bin in the hangar where he did the job, and they may still be there. So we rushed across to the waste bin and found something like 80 discarded bolts. The old bolts are the proper size. Why were smaller bolts used to replace them? And these are the ones you checked against the new ones. That's right. Yeah, I took from the carousel. There's really excellent evidence. Gold, as far as I was concerned. Instead of using the old bolts to put the new window on, the ground engineer decided to replace them. He did not check the parts catalogue to verify which bolt he needed for the job. Oh, 
เอง The bolts he chose seemed the same, but in fact were just over half a millimeter smaller. They were too thin to do the job. Early in the morning, working against the side of a hangar, the engineer couldn't tell the difference. Hours later, the window gave way. Faced with a challenge they weren't trained for, the crew still managed to pull their plane back from the brink. But the massive pressure inside an airplane doesn't need bad maintenance to rip a jet apart. That pressure can also find a tiny flaw somewhere in the design and cause a nightmare in the sky. The Airbus A320, one of the most popular passenger jets in the sky. Every day around the world, thousands of passengers board this plane. When they do, they walk through what would seem to be an obvious weak spot in the fuselage: the door. Any hole in the fuselage is a potential danger. So engineers designed passenger doors that can't be opened in flight. It is virtually impossible. I don't use that word very easily, but it is impossible for a passenger to open a plug-type door in flight. Passenger doors are plug-type doors. They're built to be slightly larger than their frames. When a plane takes off and pressurizes, the atmosphere inside the aircraft seals the door shut. That door probably has 10,000 or more pounds of pressure holding it firmly in place in that door frame, and you have to pull it out of that door frame to get it open. But not all doors on an airplane are built the same. Even designs that seem flawless on paper can rip apart in the real world. February the 24th, 1989, Honolulu Airport. United Airlines 811 is bound for Auckland, New Zealand. Expected flying time: nine and a half hours. There are 355 people on board, plus a full load of cargo. The doors close on time, and the plane leaves the gate just after 1:30 in the morning. Tell them we can handle 33 if it's available. Okay. We did notice that there were thunderstorms, so 100 miles south, right on course. Which was rather unusual for that time of night, so I left the seatbelt sign on. Captain Cronin's decision to keep that sign on will save lives. As the 747 climbs past 7,000 meters, passengers sitting just above and behind the cargo door begin to hear a strange noise. Kind of a grinding noise. I heard a like a thud. The hell! In the next nanosecond, it was pure, unadulterated pandemonium. The next thing I knew, I found myself on the stairwell. Hanging on to the rungs, and I immediately knew it was an explosive decompression. Everything on the airplane that wasn't fastened down, tied down, or secured, what became airborne. Um, the noise was incredible. The 747's cargo door had torn off, ripping away a section of the fuselage. The pressurized oxygen in the cabin shot out with explosive force. And as I looked up, that was the first time I saw this tremendous hole on the side of the aircraft that was just a void, and the seats were missing. And I immediately knew that we had lost passengers. Everything in front of us was gone. Where we were sitting, we were about six inches from the hole, so there was nothing in front of us or to the side of us. The whole side of the plane was gone. 
Actually, our feet were dangling on the hole, and uh, I first thought we, we weren't going to make it. You know, I just didn't think there was any hope. The situation is desperate, but by itself, an explosive decompression won't bring a plane down. In 811, there's a hole as big as Tulsa on the side of this thing. I mean, it's an aerodynamic disruption of massive proportions, but if it was designed the way we had designed things a long time ago, it would have unzipped. After the door came off, eventually a row of rivets held, keeping the plane from pulling itself apart. But the gaping hole is putting massive stress on the aircraft. The flight crew needs to descend as fast as possible. Left, right, valves on. Start dumping the fuel. I am dumping. Struggling to fly their badly damaged jet, the crew turn back to Honolulu Airport. And all of a sudden, we were slowing down, slowing down. And I, I said, oh my god, we've landed. We're, we're on, on ground. Probably the best landing I've ever made. When we uh, finally stopped on the runway, we deployed all 10 chutes. And the flight attendants evacuated all the passengers. Thanks to the experienced flight crew, United Airlines 811 landed with everyone on board alive. but nine passengers were missing, sucked out of the plane when the fuselage tore open, taking with it five rows of seats. One of those passengers was a New Zealander on his way home, Lee Campbell. We got a phone call from Chicago, and they just said that they, they regret to inform us that our son was missing, presumed dead. In the wake of their son's tragic death, Kevin and Susan Campbell embark on an international mission to discover exactly why the door had come off the plane. Lee can't have died for nothing. You know, you've got to find out why he died, and you've just got to make sure that uh, it never happens again. Two months after the accident, the National Transportation Safety Board holds preliminary hearings. During a break, the Campbells take matters into their own hands they remove several boxes full of files. So we quickly realised we'd got a really good set of papers with a lot of things that hadn't been released to the public. We were able to really start our investigation in earnest at that stage. The unpublished documents reveal a disturbing catalogue of problems with the 747's forward cargo door, going right back to its original design. Passenger doors are plug doors, but most cargo doors on jets open outward. This increases the space for luggage and other cargo. As the plane gains altitude, the pressure inside the jet presses outward against the door. To prevent the door from opening, Boeing had installed what it believed was a foolproof locking system. What they do is they build in multiple redundancies to make sure the door is properly latched, and does not open. Uh, and you, you build it in to a point of, uh, that it's extremely improbable that the door would ever open. The Campbell's research uncovers two major flaws with the 747 cargo doors. The first involved the locking system. To lock the cargo doors, electric motors turn C-shaped latches around pins in the door frame. A handle then moves arms or locking sectors over the top of the sea latches to prevent them from reopening. But on flight 811, the supposedly foolproof system had failed. Kevin Campbell built a model of the 747 cargo door latch. It showed the first deadly flaw in the locking system. Aluminium locking sectors could not hold the sea latch in place if the latches started to open on their own. With the aluminium locking sectors, if the sea locks tried to backwind, open electrically, it would just push the locking sector out of the way. It just simply wasn't up to the job that it was designed for. But what would cause the sea lock to backwind? The Campbells didn't have the answer but they knew they were onto something. 
During their research, they learned that two years before Flight 811, a Pan Am 747 out of Heathrow had pressurization problems as it climbed to cruising altitude. The pilot was forced to turn back. When they got back to Heathrow, they found that the door was hanging open an inch and a half at the bottom, and all of the locks were open. When it got to the maintenance base, they found that uh, all of the, the locking sectors were either bent or broken. The passengers on this flight were lucky. They had survived the faulty locking system. But why had the sea latches turned and bent the locking sectors? As the Campbells continue to search, a Pan Am report surfaces that lays out a critical issue with the cargo door's electrical system. When the cargo door's outer handle is placed in the closed position, a master lock switch should disconnect the power supply. This would stop the sea latches from turning. But something was wrong with the switch. There was power to the, the door locks with the, uh, with the outer handle closed, and the lock started to move, and it started to force the locking sectors out of the way. The faulty power switch and weak locking sectors were no match for the pressurized oxygen inside the plane. After years of being pushed by the Campbells, the NTSB produces a report that agrees. There was an inadvertent failure of either the switch or the wiring that caused an uncommanded opening of the door it's nice that other people know that you're right and had been all along and the, the support that they had given you was, you know, was vindicated. I couldn't have lived with myself if we had done no investigating ourselves. It was just something we both felt we needed to do. We didn't even discuss it. We just knew that's what we would do. After United Flight 811, the locking system on the Boeing 747 cargo doors was changed. Inspections were increased. Another potential cause of explosive decompression had been found and eliminated. That is an amazing accolade to what we've learned, not just Boeing, but what we've learned about maintenance, about structures, maintaining them and inspecting them. Since the first jet engines pushed planes higher in the sky, the aviation industry has struggled to harness and contain the deadly power of pressurized oxygen. They know all too well that a single flaw can lead to a terrifying decompression. But more than 15 years after United 811, another deadly lesson is learned. It's August the 14th, 2005. For almost an hour, Helios Flight 522 has been circling the skies over Athens. Helios 522, over. Its flight crew has stopped communicating with air traffic control. Fearing a terrorist attack, the Greek Air Force scrambles two Helios fighter jets to circle the mystery aircraft. One of them was actually in a shooting position behind uh, the 737. The other one was nearby the cockpit and he was trying to communicate visually with the person in the cockpit. The fighter pilots can't see any damage to the jet, no holes in the fuselage. There is no structural failure, there is no fire, there is no problem, obvious problem from the external view with the plane. Someone in the cockpit waves at the fighter pilot. But all too soon, the jet loses altitude and falls towards the ground. All 121 people on board are killed. It's the worst air crash in the history of Greece. Within minutes, investigators are on the scene. So we climbed over the hill, and there we were, you know, facing this uh, situation, which was beyond any, any, any description. I saw uh, a great area in front of me, which was burning. It was black. Burning, people spread, pieces of, of, uh, of the airplane. 
The autopsies add more mystery to the case. Everyone on board the Helios flight was alive up to the moment of the crash. They did not die from inhaling a toxic substance in the airplane or from an explosion. These people died on impact. But if the passengers were alive until impact, why didn't the fighter pilots see more activity on the plane? Akrivos Tsolakis is the lead investigator. He begins to dig through maintenance records. He learns that on the day of the crash, the rear door had been inspected for leaks. Before it took off on its last flight, the Helios jet arrived in Cyprus with a problem. During the trip, the cabin crew had heard loud banging and saw ice on a rear service door. To make sure there's nothing wrong with the seal on the door, the engineer runs a pressurization test. He's looking for a leak. So explain again how you tested the pressure. When I went into the cockpit, I turned the pressurization switch to manual. Switching digital pressure control unit from auto to manual. The jet's engines are turned off, so the engineer uses the plane's auxiliary power unit to force air into the cabin. It's like looking for a leak in a tire. In this case, what you're having to do is pressurize the aircraft, use a, bar a barometer, essentially, to monitor the pressure inside, uh, and look for leaks that way. A normally well-maintained jetliner of any age uh, is simply not going to be completely, uh, completely airtight. You're going to have leaks. As a matter of fact, as pilots, we know that uh, certain airplanes are going to leak more than others, and you've really got to crank the pressurization up. After completing the pressurization test, the ground engineer reports that the jet is in good working order. But the digital pressure control is left in the manual position. They were supposed to return uh, the uh, selector to the auto position. If the flight crew fails to see that the switch is on manual, their plane won't properly pressurize the oxygen available inside the plane will be just as thin as the outside atmosphere. The passengers will be directly exposed to a deadly environment in which they cannot survive. August the 14th, 2005. The worst airline disaster in Greek history has stunned the nation. Investigators are sifting through the gruesome wreckage. A few minutes after nine in the morning, Helios Flight 522 left from Cyprus bound for Athens. The crew has no idea that hours before takeoff during a maintenance test, a flight engineer has left a pressurization switch set to manual. Both the captain and co-pilot miss the fact that the plane is not set to pressurize automatically. As Helios 522 climbs, an alarm blares in the cockpit. What is it? The takeoff config warning? It's a non pressurization warning, but it sounds identical to another alarm. The pilots confuse the two. It's a critical mistake. The alarm sounded, and that alarm was misinterpreted. Most of flight crew, they will never face uh, an alarm with no pressurization in all their uh, flight career because it's a rare event. Operations, this is flight 522, over. Flight 522, what can I do for you? We have a takeoff config warning on. Sorry, can you repeat? As the pilots troubleshoot with ground engineers, life-sustaining oxygen is slowly seeping out of the plane. Eventually, oxygen masks drop in the cabin they do not fall in the cockpit. The reason that we don't have automatically deploying oxygen masks in a cockpit, there's simply too much up there, and if you had things popping out, they're gonna hit switches that they shouldn't hit. The crew don't realize they have a pressurization problem. Eventually, both the captain and the co-pilot collapse unconscious. The oxygen is too thin to breathe. We're the ones that should be trained 
consistently to understand that ears popping, anything that indicates pressurization, you don't even talk to each other before you grab that mask and put it on. The passengers are unaware that the plane is now flying itself. In emergency situations, chemical generators above the seats pump out oxygen. But there's a catch. These generators only produce enough oxygen for about 12 minutes. Well, the problem with the passenger masks is, for one thing, they're not designed to keep you oxygenated at a, at a high altitude. What they're designed to do is give you enough oxygen so that you can survive until you can, the pilots get the airplane down to a low altitude. But with both pilots already unconscious, the Helios jet did not descend so passengers could breathe without assistance. Instead, the plane flew on autopilot to Athens. When the oxygen supply stopped, the passengers passed out. By the time the Greek Air Force intercepted the Helios jet, only one person was still moving. Likely surviving with bottled oxygen, flight attendant Andreas Prodromu was still conscious when the fighters approached. He made it to the cockpit, but he couldn't save the plane. As an control, there is one person moving in the cockpit of Helios 522. Eventually, when its fuel ran out, Helios 522 crashed. Investigators eventually find the panel with the pressurization switch. Are you sure this is the way it was found? It hasn't been moved at all. All 121 people on the Helios flight died because their plane didn't carry enough life-sustaining oxygen as it climbed into the sky. It's been more than 50 years since the beginning of the passenger jet era. 50 years in which the industry has learned, sometimes painfully, how to safely fly more than 10 kilometers in the sky. When you look back at all the other accidents over the last 20 years, in most cases, we were pushing the frontier of knowledge. Unfortunately, when you're pushing the envelope, you're pushing the boundaries of design, you can encounter problems that you hadn't anticipated. In search of the safest plane imaginable, the history of aviation traces a flight path through tragic accidents to technological breakthroughs. Many of these accidents display the incredible power of explosive decompression. The Airbus A320 and every other passenger plane built today is infinitely safer than the first jets that flew in the 1950s. They have to remain safe and get even safer because we rely so heavily on this incredible mode of transportation that takes us somewhere we were never meant to be. A hot summer night in Phoenix, Arizona. It's 11 o'clock, but the maintenance workers at Southwest Airlines are just getting started. Tonight, they're going to open up a state-of-the-art Boeing 737-700. Almost 40 inspectors and mechanics are going to spend the night making sure the plane is fit to fly. Without proper maintenance, airplanes don't fly. Pilots are usually the focus for the operation of the airplane but maintenance has an equally high priority role in the safe operation of any aircraft. To keep airplanes in peak condition, they get more health checks than most passengers. It is a very intricately weaved web between the operation of the airplane and the maintenance of the airplane and the management of the airplane. Passenger planes are examined every time they come to a stop. This is the A check. A brief walk-around inspection turns up the most obvious problems. The more intensive work is done at set intervals. These are the B and C checks. Tonight, workers are performing a C check. 
From start to finish, it can require hundreds of man hours of work. It all has to get finished tonight, so the plane is back flying in the morning. It's a massive challenge, because modern jets are made of hundreds of thousands of individual pieces. In 1903, when the Wright brothers took their historic first flight near Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, their plane had some 1,500 parts. A 737 has more than 360,000. You have to ensure that every one of those components is doing its respective job. It doesn't matter how big the part is, a missing screw can jeopardize the safety of flight. It's a lesson the aviation industry has learned the hard way. January 31st, 2000. On board Alaska Airlines Flight 261, the situation is desperate. Operating a damaged plane, the captain is trying to land at Los Angeles Airport, but the aircraft is not responding to controls. The MD-83 is plunging towards the Pacific Ocean. Holy Other pilots flying nearby report the nightmare scene back to LA Air Traffic Control. Yes, sir. He is uh, definitely in a nose down position, descending quite rapidly. Definitely out of control. Plane hit Vernon, sir. Okay. Yeah, he's averted. Push the blue side up! There! Here we go! And he just hit the water. Uh, yes, sir. He, uh... Yeah, the water is uh, down. Flight 261 crashed off the coast of California at over 400 kilometers an hour. All 88 passengers and crew are killed. Investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board begin their work quickly. The cockpit voice recordings provide some of the earliest clues. We have a jam stabilizer, and we're maintaining altitude with difficulty. We immediately suspected some problem in the tail of the airplane, which is where the controls are. There's something was wrong back there. Investigators examine the MD-83's horizontal stabilizer. The stabilizer controls the plane's pitch, its ability to tilt up and down. As the stabilizer moves up, the plane's nose tilts down. As the stabilizer moves down, the nose moves up. In the MD-83, a motorized jack screw on the tail moves the stabilizer up and down. When investigators recover the tail from the crash site, they make a puzzling discovery. The jack screw wasn't mated with the nut that it screws into. It was just by itself. And the nut was found in another piece of structure a few feet away from where the jack screw was. To have a screw separate itself from a, from a nut with very thick threads surprised us. Without the jack screw, the stabilizer was beyond control. Without the stabilizer, the plane was doomed. The investigators very quickly figured out how the accident happened. Now they want to know why. The answer is tragically simple. There was no lubrication or visible grease uh, on the working area of the screw. That was uh, surprising and strange. The Federal Aviation Administration orders an immediate check on all MD-80s in the USA. At Alaska Airlines, the jack screws on six of its fleet of 34 MD-80s fail inspection. Investigators discover even more alarming evidence as they go through the carrier's maintenance records. Mechanics at Alaska Airlines report that they are under tremendous pressure to cut corners to keep the planes flying. We interviewed all 
the mechanics who had worked on these airplanes. We knew that they had been falsifying records or not doing the work they had indicated. To survive an economic recession in the 1990s, Alaska Airlines slashed their maintenance regime. With air carriers, especially those that may be economically strapped, they're going to stretch inspection cycles to the maximum. The FARs, the Federal Aviation Regulations, set a minimum level of safety. Now, if you're going to operate on a shoestring, you're only going to meet that minimum level of safety. If I'm a good carrier or I want to be a good carrier and I want to show that we're going to operate at the highest levels of safety, I'm going to typically exceed the minimums. It's going to cost more, but I'm going to exceed it. A lot of companies that say, wait, the regulations only say I only have to go to here. That's what I'm going to do. Jack screws in the company's fleet had been inspected every 500 to 700 flight hours. But in 1996, to cut costs, Alaska Airlines began checking the jack screws every 2,500 hours. At the same time, they doubled the average daily use of their fleet. If you had 600 hours between inspection points and greasing points, we have no chance of ever having a metal-to-metal -metal contact situation. But if you put that out to 2,000 hours or 2,500 hours, now what you do is eat into some of these protective stages, these barriers that we have towards uh, catastrophic failure. Proper maintenance becomes even more critical when there's no backup to a component. On the MD-83, there was no alternative if the jack screw failed. So proper maintenance was a matter of life and death. But in the aviation industry, it's also a matter of dollars and cents. There's a lot of pressure in the airline industry when you look at it, whether you're hauling boxes or hauling people. The, 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 the fact of the matter is, is that competition is stiff. And how do you get the competitive advantage against the next guy? How am I going to get more for less? And a lot of times it's labor, the other times it's maintenance. If I can stretch the inspection to 500 hours instead of 400 hours, that saves me a lot of money. To stay afloat financially, Alaska Airlines put countless lives at risk. But disaster can erupt even when an airline doesn't cut back on its maintenance regime. Going to hit the mountain! It's past midnight in Phoenix, Arizona. A maintenance crew works through a 737-700. They're performing a so-called sea check, one of the most detailed inspections any plane can go through. We work out overnight, because that's when nobody, nobody flies. It's better for the air airline to keep the airplane on ground overnight to fix them up. Tonight, 339 individual inspections are set to be made. Each one of these is tracked by computer. Anything that comes up yellow is an unscheduled procedure, a problem that's just been spotted. Unscheduled maintenance are those kinds of things typically that people will experience with their car where they're driving down the highway and all of a sudden the air conditioner doesn't work. Well, the same with an airplane. Tonight, the inspectors discover a tire on one of the main landing gears is worn out. They add it to the list of unscheduled maintenance items. It has to be replaced before the plane goes back into service. Obviously, the stakes are extremely high. Um, every night, we come to work and try to do our best job possible. Make sure everything's in working order so that people get to where they need to go. But sometimes, despite all the maintenance, the worst-case scenario comes true. A simple repair can unexpectedly lead to disaster. August the 13th, 1985, Mount Osutaka, Japan. This is the wreckage from the deadliest single plane disaster in aviation history. JAL Flight 123 crashed the night before, killing 520 passengers and crew. Only four people survived. Because the 747 jet was built in the United States, the National Transportation Safety Board joins the investigation. When I arrived in Tokyo, the atmosphere in Japan was uh, extremely stressful. The news media were everywhere. There was a tremendous amount of anger. 
Soon after the crash, experts get a helping hand from an amateur photographer. He managed to take a picture of the 747 minutes before it crashed. The picture reveals that JAL Flight 123 was flying without its massive tail fin. The tail fin houses critical control surfaces like the rudder, as well as tubes that carry the hydraulic fluids. What force could be strong enough to tear off the tail fin? I would explain everything why I didn't. Digging through the 747's maintenance history, investigators discover that seven years earlier, the jet had landed with its nose too high. The tail hit the ground and scraped along the runway. The rear part of the plane had to be repaired, including the pressure bulkhead. Japan Airlines called in Boeing technicians to help repair the cracked bulkhead. After this unscheduled maintenance, the 747 was given a clean bill of health and flew for another seven years. But this bulkhead becomes a prime suspect for the investigators. Well, we had an idea that we wanted to find the rear pressure bulkhead because we had a, a flight attendant who had been interviewed that described an explosion in the back of the airplane and she could see out. So we wanted to focus on the bulkhead. During his investigation, Schleed finds a piece of the panel that had been spliced into the bulkhead seven years before. The mystery of Flight 123 is solved. The 747 went down because of a faulty repair. The repair had, in fact, not been done correctly. There was only one row of rivets holding that joint together, uh, where there should have been uh, two rows of rivets holding the joint together. With only one row of rivets straining to hold the repaired panel in place, this was a disaster waiting to happen, especially because this was such a busy jet. This particular airplane was used in Japan on a domestic operation, so it made multiple takeoffs and landings on domestic operations, unlike most 747s that make long range hauls. So this was considered a high cycle airplane. Investigators calculate that with the repair job, the bulkhead would survive approximately 10,000 flights or cycles. But on the day of the crash, the 747 had already racked up over 12,000 cycles. On 747 jets, the cabin is pressurized, but not the tail. During flight, the pressurized cabin air presses against the repaired bulkhead. After some 12,000 cycles, this pressure stretched the faulty repair to breaking point. The highly pressurized air blasted into the hollow tail fin and blew it off. Flip up, flip up. Losing part of the tail crippled the plane's hydraulic systems. The Boeing 747 had four independent hydraulic systems to power its systems, so it had quadruple redundancy. Unfortunately, these four lines came together on the lower part of the spar, and when it separated, it sheared those four lines. All four hydraulic systems were depleted. Both hands. For some 30 minutes, the crew tried to fly their 747 using only thrust. This is like trying to drive a car using only the accelerator. No steering wheel, no brakes. Despite their heroic efforts, it was a losing battle. All this death and destruction boils down to a missing row of rivets. Why had the growing metal fatigue in the bulkhead remained undetected through seven years of scheduled maintenance and inspections? But the primary inspection method for the bulkhead area and the seams was a visual inspection. And at heavy maintenance uh, periods, when they, uh, they would take the insulation out uh, uh, off the walls and everything and off the bulkhead, uh, they would do a, a detailed visual inspection. And during subsequent maintenance checks, the faulty repair was never found.
two decades after JAL Flight 123, airlines are constantly looking for hidden flaws that aren't visible from the outside. Back at the Southwest maintenance hangar, inspectors are using a boroscope, a tiny flexible camera to inspect the engines. Engines are the heart of passenger planes. If they stop working, pilots don't have the option of pulling over to the side of the road. Yeah, there we go. In this uh, area, we're looking for cracks, looking at the uh, blades, the rotor blades, and we're looking for missing material off of them. You know, any hot spots that have worn through the metal, cracks, radial and axial cracks. Any kind of crack or trace of metal fatigue in any of the fan blades could spell disaster. Take off check below the line. Okay, your lights. August the 21st, 1995. Atlantic Southeast Airlines Flight 529, an Embraer Brasilia, is about to take off with 29 people on board. It's bound for Gulfport, Mississippi. It was, at the time, the fastest, sleekest turboprop around. Before the plane even reaches its cruising altitude, something seems to explode outside. The sound of that was tremendous. It was as if someone had taken a baseball bat and hit an aluminum garbage can as hard as they could. It was just a, a gigantic crashing sound. And the airplane immediately lurched to the left. No matter what the flight crew tries to do, the plane pulls violently to the left. Autopilot, engine control. Oh, hold it. Over there. Captain and co-pilot are pushed to the brink of their experience. Help me. Help me. Help me hold it. Help me hold it! Atlantic Southeast Flight 529 crashes near the small farming community of Carrollton, Georgia. Emergency? Yes, we have a plane crashed in our backyard. A plane crash? All 29 people survive the violent landing. <laughs> but 10 passengers eventually die from their injuries. Called into action, the NTSB creates teams to examine various parts of the plane. Jim Hookey, an aerospace engineer, is in charge of the propeller maintenance group. We came along a lot of pieces of the wing, um, came along the, um, the propeller assembly that was missing one part of the blade. The blade broke in a very specific fashion, leaving behind all the telltale signs of a fatigue fracture. A fatigue fracture tends to be a very flat fracture. Also has what we call beach marks radiating out from the origin. So you see these radiating concentric rings coming from the origin of the crack. Hooky had good reason to focus on the broken propeller blade. 17 months before ASA 529, identical propeller blades broke on separate flights over Canada and Brazil. Fortunately, in both cases, the aircraft managed to land safely. The manufacturer of the propeller was Hamilton Standard. Hookey and his team start combing through Hamilton Standard's maintenance records. They're looking for anything out of the ordinary. It's whatever's abnormal. You really don't know what you're looking for until you find it, but you just go through and there's a lot of routine maintenance is done, regular inspections, A, A, A checks, B checks, C checks, 
and then there's the non-routine maintenance that occurs if something is broken or a truck hits the airplane or they have a bird strike or something like that. And it's those that you, you look for. The maintenance records reveal that the broken propeller blade had earlier problems. We found out that that propeller blade had actually been removed from service once already uh, for a crack indication. And that became the first clue about there may be a problem with that propeller blade and those inspections. Deep inside the hollow propeller, investigators find what they're looking for. In the hollow interior, or taper bore, weights are inserted to balance the prop. They're kept in place by a cork. This simple cork was the trigger in a deadly chain of events. About 95% of the cork that's produced in the world is used by the medical industry. And for aesthetic purposes and for sterilization, they like to have the light color. So the cork is, is bleached with chlorine. The NTSB discovers that moisture inside the propeller caused the chlorine in the cork to leach out and corrode the propeller's aluminum alloy. They also notice something else on the broken blade. On the inner surface, extending about four centimeters from the fracture, there are a series of sanding marks. Going through the blade's repair records, Hookie notices the initials CSB, Christopher Scott Bender. This technician worked at a Hamilton Standard repair facility. When Christopher Bender watches news of the accident, he learns that the investigators are examining the Hamilton propeller. And as soon as I heard that, my heart just sank. I was like, you know, I, I think I might have even cried a little bit because I was just, you know, just emotionally overwhelmed that, you know, something I had put my hands on, a procedure that somebody trusted me to do failed, uh, and because of that, somebody had died. After discovering that it was Bender who last worked on the deadly propeller blade, the NTSB now has to find out how the blade had passed inspection at Hamilton Standard. Investigators ask Bender to perform his standard maintenance technique on the propeller. He demonstrated how he would go down into the barrel of the taper bore with a fiber optic bore scope and look for cracks. And therein lied one of the primary problems, the bore scope that he was using had a bright white light that would put a lot of glare back into the inspector's eyes really did not lend itself to the inspection that was required. And investigators also find a gap in Bender's training. He had never been shown what a crack would look like. He was just told to find a crack and he would look for a crack. When he was examining the propeller blade, Bender had been unable to detect any evidence of corrosion. He then did what he'd been told to do, polish the inside of the blade. He was given a directive to use a repair to blend out the inside of the taper bore. He blended it out, he did an inspection, and the blending that he had done had roughened the surface so it actually masked the indication of the crack in the subsequent inspection, and the blade was returned to service where the crack continued to propagate until it ultimately reached critical length and separated. The draft accident report we present to you today involves Atlantic Southeast Airlines Flight 529. And Embraer. According to the NTSB, by polishing the blade, Hamilton Standard had unwittingly removed all traces of the crack. Even a later, more thorough ultrasound examination could not detect it. Life with no inspection. The company that manufactured Flight 529's propeller is now renamed Hamilton Sunstrand. Its inspection and repair process was made more stringent, in some cases exceeding FAA requirements. Flight 529 was the last time one of its propellers failed in flight. You know, I wish this had never happened. I wish I could go back in time and, and fix it and take care of it, that it didn't happen. Out of the thousands of parts on board an Embraer Brasilia, a simple small cork was the key to a horrific accident. 
ASA Flight 529 underlines the critical need for proper maintenance. But sometimes maintenance can create the potential for disaster when a new component is installed into an older airplane. London Center, Swiss Air 111 Heavy is declaring pan, pan, pan. We have smoke in the cockpit. It's early morning in Phoenix, Arizona. Southwest Airlines engineers are continuing their scheduled maintenance of a 737. Southwest is unique among larger airlines. It flies just one kind of plane, the 737. Tonight, engineers are working on a 700 model, one of the newest 737s. But the company's very first 300 model, bought in the mid-1980s, is still flying. You can still operate an old airplane as long as you have inspection protocols. When you look at some of the cargo carriers, they're operating airplanes that are 30 and 40 and even 50 years old. They're still reliable airplanes. They've been maintained. They've been retrofitted with modern day equipment. Updating older planes is a standard part of maintenance. But sometimes installing a new component in an older plane can lead to tragedy. Inside this makeshift lab are the shattered remains of Swiss Air Flight 111. On September the 2nd, 1998, the passenger jet crashed off the coast of Nova Scotia, Canada, killing everyone on board. Recovered from the seabed, the debris is overwhelming. There is almost 250 kilometers of wiring alone. In Swiss Air, we've had about two million pieces of airplane, and we pretty much almost had to look at them all. In the business, we refer to uh, often finding the golden nugget. That's saying, aha, there's the cause of the accident. Somewhere in this wreckage, investigators hope to find that golden nugget, the one piece that will reveal the reason why Swiss Air 111 crashed into the Atlantic Ocean. The cockpit voice recorder gives investigators their first critical clues. Do you spell something? Yeah, what is that? Go have a look, I'll take the controls. Roger, you have control. The first officer checks the area around the air conditioning vent. Nothing seems wrong. I don't see anything, Urs. And there's nothing up there now. Captain Zimmerman is troubled by the smell of smoke. There it is again. He starts to divert the plane to the yeah, nearest airport. Find the closest place to land, Stefan. He radios air traffic control in Moncton, New Brunswick. Moncton Center, Swiss Air 111 Heavy is declaring pan, pan, pan. We have smoke in the cockpit. Pan, pan, pan is an international term used to notify air traffic control of an urgent situation. Three miles to fly to the threshold. It's one step below declaring Mayday. Uh, I guess Boston, uh, we need for... Swiss Air 111 is directed to Halifax and starts its descent. Okay, then I vector you uh, to set up for runway 06 at Halifax. The pilots appear calm and in control. Halifax is just 20 minutes away. They want us to turn to the south. At that point, everything was normal. I, I gave the pilot an initial descent and uh, he requested to level off at an intermediate altitude to get the cabin in order for the landing, which took to mean that they needed to pack away dinner trays and uh, things like that. Cabin bus off. Cabin bus off, Roger. But the seemingly controlled situation on board Swiss Air Flight 111 escalates into a full-scale emergency. Autopilot, disconnect. We are declaring emergency now, Swiss Air 111, at time 0124. All my screens are down. I'm trying. I stand by instruments, maintaining 300. Shortly after declaring an emergency, the plane goes silent. It was probably one of the most helpless feelings that any individual can have 
not being able to do anything but just sit and watch the target and hope that it would turn back toward the airport. And of course it didn't. At 10.31 p.m. Atlantic time, residents of Peggy's Cove hear a devastating explosion. From the cockpit voice recorder, investigators know they're dealing with a fire and not a plane that was malfunctioning. We found no anomalies or no problems in any of that flight data that suggested there was a problem with the aircraft. Investigators work their way through the hangar of wreckage recovered from the Atlantic Ocean. Finally, they find scorch marks which revealed that the source of the fire was in the back of the cockpit, directly behind the first officer. Following this trail leads the team to an unlikely suspect, the entertainment system in first class. The Swiss Air MD-11s provided first class with one of the world's most sophisticated entertainment systems. Passengers in first class could choose their own movies, access the internet, and even gamble. This entertainment system was not part of the original MD-11 design. The system had some major deficiencies. It was getting very hot. It drew a lot of power. And uh, thereby, for example, raising the cabin, uh, cabin temperature uh, considerably, because it was always running. They did not install a simple off switch, nor did they install appropriate cooling systems. Anytime you have an electrical system or you're putting an aftermarket install into an airplane, you run the risk of compromising the integrity of the aircraft itself as it was originally designed. When informed about the flaw in the wiring, Swiss Air immediately disabled the entertainment system on the rest of its fleet. But investigators discover that another piece of the jet had helped the fire spread with alarming speed. And in this instance, we did uh, discover a wire that uh, arced in that way, and right next to it was some very flammable material called uh, metallized polyethylene terephthalate covering material that uh, covers the insulation blankets. This polyethylene insulate was common on commercial airlines around the world. It had somehow passed the industry's flammability tests, which require materials to self-extinguish after a reasonable period of time. This thermoacoustical material that was in this aircraft was very flammable, even though it passed a test. It does sustain and it does propagate flame. The fire spread quickly from the cockpit back into the first-class galleys. Some metals showed heat damage from temperatures as high as 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit. Less than 12 minutes after the crew declared a pan-pan, the fire disabled all electronics in the cockpit. In the aftermath, Swiss Air removed the flammable insulate from its entire MD-11 fleet. The rest of the industry was required to follow suit. In Phoenix, Arizona, flight engineers continue their sea check on the 737. It includes testing the plane's rudder. The rudder is one of the jet's most vital control surfaces. It allows a plane to turn left and right. OK, CBS uh, rudder should turn. All right, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. A problem here could have terrifying consequences. Uh, you're clear on me, okay? In fact, despite years of proper maintenance, a problem with a tiny component with the 737 rudder killed more than 100 people. Not even the most diligent maintenance workers could have spotted it. March the 3rd, 1991. 
United Flight 585 begins its final approach into Colorado Springs. Another 10 hour game. 30 flaps. Oh, God, sick! 15 flaps! 15! Going up! Twenty passengers and five crew are killed. Investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board descend on Colorado Springs. My first sense that it was going to take some time in the, to investigate the accident was, was the damage that we saw in the parts. An aerospace engineer by training, Greg Phillips is in charge of investigating United 585's flight control systems. We focused in after eliminating uh, other flight control surfaces that we thought could contribute to the role. Uh, we started looking at the rudder. But investigators face a critical obstacle. Most of the plane's parts are too crushed or burned for testing. Luckily, one vital component is still reasonably intact. This is the power control unit, or PCU. Used constantly during flight, especially during landings, the PCU performs like a car's power steering. When the pilot pushes on a rudder pedal, the PCU uses hydraulic fluid to convert the gentle movements of a pilot's foot into the pressure needed to move the 737's enormous rudder. The heart of the PCU is the dual servo valve. This valve is roughly the size of a soda can. It contains two extremely thin slides that glide past one another. These slides direct the flow of hydraulic fluid which moves the rudder. When a technician opens up the power control unit, it seems to be in working order. We didn't have any absolute indication or information that we could point to that said the rudder, power control unit, the servo valve, or any, any part of that flight control system caused that accident. It's a pass. For only the fourth time in its history, the NTSB releases a report that does not reach a conclusion. We had put a lot of time and effort in, into the investigation, and we just weren't sure what had happened. Less than two years later, Greg Phillips and the NTSB would be brought back to the mysterious disaster through the crash of another 737. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Shoot! What the hell is this? Oh, God, no! Oh! September the 8th, 1994. US Air Flight 427 has crashed near Pittsburgh, killing everyone on board. When we first arrived at the crash site, first of all, there was no aircraft there. There were only bits and pieces of the airplane. It wasn't really recognizable as an airplane. Investigators begin to see that this crash is a mirror image of United Flight 585. On final approach, United 585 rolled right, while US Air 427 rolled left. Both crews are caught by surprise. After a terrifying struggle, both crash with no survivors. Once again, investigators test the dual servo valve, but they come up empty-handed. That unit passed all its operational tests. There wasn't any indication that it had failed. We were going up against an aircraft that had an incredible safety history. It was really a, everything you could see for 30 years. This has been a great airplane. We were trying to prove that there was something wrong with the straight-A student. The team reaches another dead end. 
But almost two years later, they get a third chance to solve this deadly mystery. In Phoenix, Arizona, a long night of maintenance is winding down. Over 30 mechanics and some half a dozen inspectors have combed through a Southwest Airlines 737. The team has made more than 400 separate checks. Parts have been replaced. Southwest 737 N427WN is almost ready to fly again. Hopefully it'll push back out of the hangar. We'll do some leak checks, make sure everything's working, nothing's leaking. Then it'll go to the gate for uh, departure time. But it's a truth in maintenance that engineers can only fix what they know is broken. For several years, every 737 that flew had a hidden danger that not even the most careful technician could have spotted. In the early 1990s, two 737s crashed in mysterious accidents. In both cases, the jets spiraled out of control. In 1996, the same malfunction strikes again. It's June the 9th. Captain Brian Bishop prepares to land in Richmond, Virginia. Then, just like United 585 and US Air 427, his plane rolls out of control. Oh, what? I turned the yoke the opposite direction and stood on the opposite rudder pedal. Uh, the pedal didn't move for me. We didn't know to what extent, but we knew we had a problem with the rudder. For over 30 seconds, Bishop struggles to control his renegade plane. And then, just as suddenly, the 737 calms down and goes back to horizontal. We have started the checklist. Almost before I could finish the sentence, all of a sudden there was a, just a wham. The 737 is once again out of control. Then, out of the blue, Eastwind 517 is back on track. Wasting no time, Captain Bishop gets it onto the tarmac. Taxing in is, is when I realized my legs were shaking. We launched to the scene. The airplane literally didn't move, uh, stayed at its location in the airport till we got down there. Suddenly, they had a 737 that had had a rudder incident that was intact, and they had a pilot who was alive and who could talk about it. I think they were much happier to have the airplane than me. Investigators zero in on the 737's rudder controls. The power control unit is tested again and again, but it performs perfectly. Refusing to give up, investigator Tom Houter decides to try a different test. One fellow mentioned a test they had done in the military of a thermal shock. The power control unit is soaked in dry ice and blasted with nitrogen gas at minus 40 degrees Celsius. Then it's injected with superheated hydraulic fluid. It's then given a command to start working. As we were standing there listening to the, the actuator move left and right, left and right, it stopped. And it was not commanded to stop. It just jammed. Stop working completely. The team has discovered that a small hydraulic valve that controls the rudder of the world's most popular jetliner can jam in the right circumstances. And the valve can jam without leaving behind any traces. When investigators double check their results, they discover another major flaw. Careful analysis of the data a couple of the engineers recognized that it not only stopped working, but actually left became right and right became left. There was actually a movement uh, of fluid in, into places that it shouldn't have gone. And the reversal is like driving your car. You turn to the right, it goes left. 
you're not gonna figure out this failure mode until you go off the road. And in these cases, that's the pilots were, were faced with something so unusual that they didn't understand what was happening. What the hell is this? That would explain why the first officer, Chuck Emmett, would keep his foot on the rudder pedal because he's thinking, why isn't the plane going right? And he's feeling the plane go to the left. In the aftermath of these disasters, pilots received better training on how to deal with sudden rudder problems. Boeing spent hundreds of millions of dollars redesigning and replacing the rudder's dual servo valve on thousands of 737s around the world. One thing we don't like at the safety board is to have an undetermined accident because then we can't make a change to improve safety. So out of US Air 427, United 585, we have a much safer 737 fleet. It's 7 a.m. After an eight-hour shift, the maintenance is finished on this Southwest Airlines 737. According to their maintenance reports, the team has conducted 78 unscheduled procedures and 339 scheduled inspections. I think uh, each one of us out here has a sense of pride in themselves that we do the best job that we possibly can day in, day out. Obviously, the stakes are high. Every life is important. Despite the horror of airplane disasters, they're still extremely rare, especially given how often passenger planes take off and land. Sometimes we obscure the fact that we fly millions and millions and millions of people day in and day out without putting a scratch on even the airplane, let alone the people. This is the most amazing system. This system depends on the dedicated team of professionals committed to taking care of these 21st century masterpieces. Planes so well built that they could fly almost as long as we're willing to take care of them. We've learned now how to inspect and maintain these things and even rebuild them to where they should have an indefinite life. They're built tough and they should be able to last forever if they're maintained properly. It's just after 8.30 in the morning in Sanford, Florida. These student pilots walk out to ground school. Their topic today, a Cirrus SR-20. This is one of the newer models. We can tell just from looking at it because of the lights on the wingtips called recognition lights or recon. Every year, dozens of students enroll at the Delta Connection Academy, hoping to eventually become pilots with major airlines. Their lives, and one day the lives of the passengers they fly, depend on their deep understanding of their airplane. From this side, right here, you can see the propeller governor. The majority of our students come to us with zero or very little flight time. We want to run someone through our entire program and end up placing them uh, with one of the regional carriers. The wingtips here are called Horner wingtips. They help to reduce the induced drag. These flight students are getting started on smaller aircraft. In the years to come, they will move into large commercial jets boasting the latest in technology. When you go back to the Wright brothers, they had no automation and everything was by muscle power other than a small internal combustion engine. Everything that they did when they moved the wings, the elevators and the rudders, they did manually. But in the last hundred years, technology has revolutionized flying. Pilots share the cockpit with automated computer systems that control virtually every aspect of flight. It can do everything now up to and including land the airplane. Everything is set so that the autopilots and automation systems are tools for the pilot to use, but they're not a replacement. It's a critical lesson for student pilots to learn. Safe flight is a balance between automation and training. If a pilot makes a mistake, or if an instrument malfunctions, these flying computers can turn into lethal machines that can't be controlled. Lima, Peru, October the 2nd, 1996. 
Aero Peru Flight 603 prepares for takeoff for Santiago, Chile. The plane is a four-year-old Boeing 757, a highly sophisticated jet known for its reliability and safety. The 757 is flown by two of the national airline's best pilots, Captain Eric Shriver and First Officer David Fernandez. There are 61 passengers and nine crew members on board. The jet is among a new generation of computer-controlled aircraft in which pilots are trained to rely on a central data system that is designed to reduce errors, both mechanical and human. Gear up. Tonight, though, within minutes of takeoff, the flight begins to go horribly wrong. The altimeters are stuck. The altimeter indicates how high the aircraft is flying over the ground. It reads zero, but the plane is clearly airborne. This is really new. Keep V2 plus 10. The 757 is equipped with three altimeters. One for the pilot, one for the co-pilot, and one for backup. All three seem to be dead. As the two men try to solve the first problem, they lose another crucial instrument, the air speed indicator. The speed. Eh? The speed. What's going on? We're not climbing. No, I am climbing, but the speed. Hold it. Maintain speed. Bewildered by the host of confusing warnings, Captain Shriver decides to land. Lima Tower, Aero Peru 603. We are in an emergency. Aero Peru 603, Lima. We are declaring an emergency. We have no basic instruments, no altimeter, no airspeed indicator. Declaring emergency. To add to their problems, Shriver and Fernandez are flying at night over water with no visual reference points. Not being able to trust their instruments, the pilots are flying blind. The airplane was controllable you first have to diagnose what's wrong. And it's very easy from 2020 hindsight, sitting here in a chair on a nice sunny day, to say, this is what he should have done. But in the cold, dark night, with bells and whistles going off, uh, it's very difficult to analyze conflicting information that you're getting. Unable to trust their instruments, the pilots have to depend on information from the ground. Can you give us the airspeed, please, if you have us on the radar? Yes, affirmative. As of 10 seconds, it seems that you're climbing at level 6,000 at 22 miles south on heading 195. OK, we have that. We are on heading 190, and we have 7,000 feet on the altimeter. Yes, correct. You are now reaching 7,000. Even as they try to return to the airport, the havoc in the cockpit gets worse. Systems warn that they're over speed. Over speed. They're flying too fast. Extend the speed brakes. Now the stall warning sounds. And then. Too low terrain. What's happening? Too low terrain. We have the terrain alarm. We have the terrain alarm. The ground proximity alarm warns them that they're flying dangerously low. Indicated a flight level of 10,000 over the sea. There is no checklist for if you have these seven or eight warnings going off, which they did, and they couldn't shut them off. Altitude is 9,700. 9,700? Yes, correct. Do you have any visual reference? but it is indicating too low terrain. Are you sure you have us on the radar at 50 miles? Hey, look. The crew is bombarded with conflicting warnings. They have no idea which of them to believe. Suddenly, they realize the horrible truth. We're hitting water. Pull it up. They're flying just meters above the water. We're going to turn it over. Aero Peru 603, Lima.
There are no survivors from Flight 603. All because something caused the onboard computers to go haywire. Searching through the Pacific waters, investigators managed to find the data recorders. It was clear to us that uh, there were, they were really experiencing a problem with airspeed and altitude. On the 757, devices called pitot-static tubes measure the airspeed and altitude. They are small external sensors which relay that information to the plane's computerized systems. Deep underwater, tape is discovered covering the plane's sensors. How the tape got there leads investigators back to the maintenance crew at Lima Airport. Just before Aero Peru 603 lifted off from Lima, maintenance workers had cleaned the jet. A worker had covered the static ports with tape to protect them. This is standard procedure. But when the maintenance was complete, the worker forgot to remove the tape. It was a small oversight with tragic results. The inspector who was supposed to quality check his work did not do it. And the supervisor out on the line that night was not there, he was sick. And there was a, um, a regular mechanic who was filling that role. He did not see it. In this case, the captain did the pre-flight. Um, they do a walk around looking for just that kind of thing. The captain did the pre-flight that night, and he did not detect it either. Yes, correct. You are now reaching 7,000. The blocked tubes also explain why the air traffic controllers told the crew they were flying at 7,000 feet. The information on the plane's height isn't calculated by radar on the ground, but by the plane's onboard systems. From 7,000 feet, the plane began to slowly descend but the onboard systems couldn't detect it. Your distance is and the air traffic controller had no way to know the altitude indicated on his system was wrong. North three, six, zero. Blindsided by bewildering readings from their instruments, the crew was completely lost. Aero Peru, six, they had no idea where they were, how high they were flying, or how fast they were going. We're heading water! Pull it up! Climb! Climb Aero Crew 603 if you need to pull up. Aero Peru was a deadly lesson about how dependent pilots have become on their automated flight systems and how helpless they can be when the systems are crippled. Student pilots need to understand the complex technology at the heart of their airplanes. When something goes wrong, they need to know who's in control. Because even an experienced pilot can rely too heavily on his systems. And when he does, disaster can be just seconds away. All right, gentlemen, what we're going to do today is practice rejected takeoffs in preparation for the V1 cuts. It'll be engine fire, engine failure, or loss of directional control. At the Delta Connection Flight School in Sanford, Florida, students are facing the worst in the safety of a simulator. No pilot can graduate unless they can deal with problems they may never have to face in the real world. The course that I teach, we typically, they work as a crew, and they go, they'll get 26 hours in the simulator, 13 hours in each seat. Simulation can now introduce problems that are hard to introduce in the air. Doing it with simulation allows it to be repeated, and then if you are ever faced with the emergency, it becomes a, almost a matter of routine. All right, Connection 500, you're clear for takeoff. Clear for takeoff, from way four, Connection 500. Right after takeoff, the students are faced with an emergency. And we got a left engine oil pressure. When you get one of those warnings, don't just punch it out. Go ahead and acknowledge it so both pilots are in the, in the loop. You're both on the same page. All right. All right. You got a left engine oil pressure. I'll take flight controls. Are you ready? I have flight controls. They run through the drill again and again, 
because surviving in the air depends on getting it right in the simulator. In an actual cockpit, even a small inconvenience can escalate into a desperate struggle to save the airplane. February the 19th, 1985. China Airlines Flight 006 is tumbling through the sky. No response, Captain! He's been 80 knots and falling. One of the engines has failed. No response. Their instruments seem to be making no sense. People just popped up like popcorn, hitting the cabin. We didn't know we we're going to live or die. The 747 falls more than 10 kilometers in two minutes. The pilots can barely keep it airborne. You know, this airplane is totally out of control. It is going to crash. The jet nosedives towards the Pacific Ocean. Then, just moments away from impact, the crew regains control of the plane. Bookland Center, Dynasty 006, will be carrying an emergency. Dynasty 006, Oakland Center, you are now cleared. You are free to descend at pilot's discretion. After surviving a tremendous fall, Captain Min Yin Ho makes a smooth textbook landing. I thought he was a hero. He saved our life. And we thought he was a hero and everything was fine. Two dozen passengers have suffered minor injuries. One crew member is hospitalized and soon released. But the 747 looks like it's been through a war zone. Parts of the entire tailplane at the end were ripped off as though a tornado had come through or a crane had been in and ripped pieces out of it. Investigators soon realized the damage to the plane wasn't the cause of the problems, but had actually occurred during the plane's wild plunge. They pour through maintenance records and flight logs to try to determine the cause of the near-fatal incident. Inside the plane, investigators find a worn valve. It led directly to the failure of the jet's fourth engine. But this shouldn't have caused the plane to fall through the sky. Engine four flamed out. The loss of uh, thrust on a four-engine airplane is a, a minor event. Uh, it's an event, you have to take care of it, but the airplane will fly on three engines with no difficulty. I do not think I was fatigued. The captain tells investigators that while the crew was dealing with the faulty engine, he left the autopilot in control of the plane. But on this 747, the autopilot does not control the rudder. Autopilots are set to maintain stable flight. If something goes wrong, the system tries to respond. With more engine power on the left wing, the China Airlines jet began turning right. The autopilot reacted by using the plane's ailerons to try to keep the 747 flying straight. But the ailerons weren't up to the job. The jet kept turning. In order to keep it from turning to the right, the proper thing to do would have been to step on the rudder. Now, it's possible that he'd forgotten that the autopilot didn't use the rudder. He may have been assuming all along that the autopilot was just flying the airplane the way a human being would have, which it wasn't. Focused on his malfunctioning engine, Captain Ho left the autopilot in control. But without the help of the rudder, the ailerons were losing their battle to keep the plane level. The gentle turn got steeper. The airplane started to lose speed, and in the end, it was really that little error of airmanship, the failure to step on that left rudder pedal, that triggered everything else. We're banking right, Captain. Airspeed 230. Facing mounting problems, the captain finally takes complete control of his aircraft. We're banking right, Captain. I'm disengaging autopilot. When the autopilot snaps off, 
his situation only gets worse. Without the ailerons to control the jet's bank, the plane flips over. It plunges into thick clouds and Captain Ho is unable to get his bearings. The crew has no visual reference point. They have no idea which way is up. They're totally dependent on their attitude indicators, but they don't think they're working properly. I've lost the ADI. The ADIs have no function. It's going out of limits. But the instruments had not malfunctioned. They told the crew an unbelievable truth. They were falling towards the Pacific Ocean. They simply didn't believe what they were seeing, and they thought they had lost their attitude instruments. They hadn't lost their attitude instruments. The airplane was, in fact, embarking on an aerobatic maneuver. You can see the stewardesses, all these people who didn't have their seat belt on, they were flying. It's only when the plane finally breaks free of the clouds that Captain Ho is able to regain control of his plane. I can see the horizon! Because he now has a visual reference. By the time Captain Ho takes full control, it was almost too late. The near-fatal dive highlights the need for pilots to avoid relying too much on their computers. So what automation has done, in a sense, is, re is taken pilots and taken them from being hands-on kind of controllers of the machine to monitors of what the automation is doing to the machine. You really are just sitting there with your arms folded, and this goes on for hour after hour after hour, and understandably, people become stupefied. But whatever mistakes the flight crew made, they did succeed in their ultimate task. The one big thing they did right is they saved the airplane. And in principle, that's all you ever need to do right. You need to save the airplane and you need to save the passengers. And that's what they did. Student pilots practice emergencies again and again to ensure that when disaster strikes, they handle it correctly. Automation is an enormous aid to long distance flying. But if a crew doesn't fully understand how their plane works, they can quickly get into a situation from which they cannot escape. Autopilot engaged. Autopilot engaged. Ten years after the China Airlines mishap, another crew is baffled by a more complicated autopilot and fails to take control until it's too late. March 1994, Siberia. Search parties comb through the wreckage of Russian International Airlines Flight 593. All 75 people on board are dead. The plane was one of the newest in the fleet, a European-built Airbus A310. Listening to the cockpit voices, investigators are shocked by what they hear. children's voices in the cockpit. They are stunned when they realize these children had operated the flight controls. The children were the son and daughter of the pilot in command, Captain Yaroslav Kudrinsky. Investigators begin to piece together an almost unbelievable story. On the evening of March the 22nd, 1994, Flight 593 begins its scheduled 10-hour journey to Hong Kong. I think it's going to be nice trip. Several hours into the jet's flight, the aircraft is cruising on autopilot. On board are two children taking their first international flight, Jana and Elda Kudrinsky. A family friend and fellow pilot brings the children in to see their father. This is first officer Igor Vladimirovich Piskarev. It's the beginning of a deadly chain of events. What do you think of our new airplane? 
It's very nice. It's amazing. Flight 593 is now over 2,000 miles east of Moscow, near the middle of Siberia. Secure in the knowledge that the autopilot is flying the plane, Captain Kudrinsky allows his children to sit in the pilot's seat and hold the controls. Unlike the China Airlines 747, the more sophisticated autopilot on this jet can control every part of the plane, including the rudder. Elder's small pressure on the controls actually turns off part of the autopilot. Eldar is now manually controlling the jet's ailerons. Imperceptibly at first, the plane begins to bank. No one in the cockpit responds to the gradual change in direction. And the very design of the plane hides the fact that the jet is on the brink of disaster. Yes, it is. Another peculiarity of the plane is that it has no alarm signaling the disengaging of the autopilot in the list channel. While our Russian planes have an alarm sounding in such an event. The autopilot is still controlling the plane's other functions. Only the ailerons are in Eldar's hands. But it's enough to affect the plane's flight. Moments later, the Airbus is banking at 45 degrees. The force of the turn pushes everyone into their seats. Guys! The increased G-force makes it difficult to reach the controls. Call it. Call the control column. Eldar is the only one with both hands on the controls. The speed of the turn is pushing him back in his seat. The other way, turning to the left. I am turning it left. Okay, get out. But Eldar can't leave. His body feels twice its normal weight. Suddenly, an alarm sounds. The autopilot is shutting down. When the jet reaches such an extreme position, the autopilot is designed to completely disengage. It's a safety feature to put the pilot back in complete control. But in this case, a teenager is in the captain's seat. The plane begins to dive towards the ground. Get it to the left, there's the ground! The plane dives at an incredible speed, plunging over 200 meters per second. For the passengers, it's like having an elevator suddenly fall out from under them. Get up. Get up. Captain Kudrinsky fights his way back to the pilot's seat. But it's too late to save Flight 593. As in the China Airlines incident almost a decade before, the Russian crew was confused by their automation. But in this case, they couldn't regain control until it was too late. The accident began not with a mechanical problem, but with a simple decision made by a very experienced pilot. I've never heard of anything like that before or since. It was very unprofessional on the part of the captain. The first officer also bears some responsibility for not raising major objections immediately to allow someone unqualified to sit in the seat of a commercial airliner is unthinkable. The crew's mistake was compounded because they didn't fully understand their computerized systems. We've gone into a zone, a holding pattern. Ten years later, another experienced pilot gets confused by his instruments. And this time, the situation is complicated by a common sensation pilots are trained to ignore. Paul Morrow is an instructor at the Delta Connection Academy in Florida. His job is to put students in extremely uncomfortable situations 
and then get them to land safely. Upset recovery is where we take a student or any pilot and we try to get them the ability to recover their aircraft from an unusual attitude or an upset, such as weak turbulence, wind shear, uh, unintentional stall. We're going to do a low level pass and bring right down to the edge of the runway and then just about halfway down we're going to break up and demonstrate how uh, quickly we can get the aircraft into a nose high situation. At that point we're experiencing in that first portion of the pull up we're experiencing the max G load in that turn. We're hitting just about six, six and a half G's for that pull. Six G's, you're experiencing six times your body weight. I weigh 200 pounds, so six times that. At that point I feel like I weigh 1200 pounds to my body. It feels like I'm being squeezed completely all over my entire body. It feels like your face is kind of peeling down over you. And it's just a, uh, once you get used to it, it's kind of fun. In a tightly controlled situation, with an instructor in the next seat, a student pilot learns to cope with intense physical sensations that can disorient and confuse. Pilots have to overcome these sensations and even ignore them. Trusting what your body is telling you can have deadly results. January the 3rd, 2004. A Flash Airlines charter flight is preparing to depart from the popular tourist resort of Sharm El Sheikh, Egypt. 148 people are on board. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Captain Kader and his entire crew, we welcome you on board Flash Airlines Boeing 737-300. The captain is 53-year-old Kader Abdullah, a former officer in the Egyptian Air Force. He has over 7,000 hours flying experience. Clouds and sky clear. QNH In the darkness before dawn, Captain Kader and his crew execute a smooth takeoff. Flying manually, they haven't yet engaged the plane's autopilot. But while still climbing, the flight plan is already beginning to fall apart. Turning right, sir. What? Aircraft is turning right. Turning right? How turning right? Overbank. Autopilot. Autopilot in command. Autopilot. In the morning light, investigators find no one has survived the horrific accident. The plane had just taken off and it looked very strange why this accident happened so quickly after takeoff. French and American investigators join Egyptian authorities in the search. It takes two weeks just to find and recover the cockpit voice and flight data recorders. Investigators explore dozens of possibilities, including the idea the crash was caused by vertigo. Vertigo is a physiological condition, and it's based on the inner ear. Over a dark ocean, without a defined visual horizon, no ground lights, the pilot may not be able to perceive visually whether he was flying up, down, left, or right. And if the fluid in his inner ear was moving or he tilted his head, that may induce a sensation, a physiological sensation, that may cause the pilot to believe the airplane is flying straight and level when it's actually turning. Roger, when ready, inshallah. Left turn to establish 306, Sharm VOR. As the plane banked over the Red Sea, it slowly began going off course. But the pilot says nothing. It seems that he's unaware of the changes to his flight path. It is actually a very high workload situation. And when there are no visual cues outside because it's a moonless night, 
and you're over featureless territory with no lights in it, you really, as a professional pilot, should be totally aware of the fact that this is a situation in which you could get disorientated. Precisely what the captain perceived is unknown. What is known is that his control wheel slowly inched towards the right. Turning right, sir. What? Aircraft is turning right. How turning right? In this particular instance, not only are you trying to fly the airplane and understand situationally what's happening, but you're going through the mental gymnastics because your expectations are one way. Meanwhile, you have the first officer who's telling him something that's totally different. Even with all the conflicting information he was getting, investigators discover that Captain Kader almost recovered control of his plane. It is interesting that the recovery starts as the airplane turns towards the coastline. The lights on the shore would have given the pilots a clear and unmistakable view of the aircraft's attitude. This is the moment that the disorientation disappears, and this is the moment that the recovery begins. Sadly, there isn't enough time to save the aircraft. The tragic fact remains that Captain Kader had all the information he needed to save the plane right in front of him. The thing that is important when you're experiencing spatial disorientation or, or vertigo is to put absolute implicit trust in your instruments that they are telling you the truth and that whatever your sensation is, is a limitation of human beings. Trust the instruments. It's a lesson that's hammered home every day at the Delta Connection Academy. Brian Patricia is one of dozens of students here who wants to fly commercial passenger jets. It's a goal that's still years away. It should take me between five to six years at a regional airline before I move on to the major airlines. It's a typical journey. Senior crew members for international carriers often have thousands of hours of flying under their belt. But each one of them started with none. There's a very old saying, as soon as you feel like you're no longer learning with aviation, get out of it, because it's going to hurt you. Training is ongoing. Recurrent training is an integral part of safe flying. The reason we have the safe level of uh, flight that we do today is in a very large part because of the adequacy and completeness of the training. Relying on your instruments, trusting your automation is one of the most fundamental lessons of flight training. Insert the ignition key, clear the propeller area, and then start the engine. Every safe flight, from small planes to jumbo jets, depends on pilot and plane working together. But even if a jet's technology is crippled, modern planes are so well built, pilots can still bring them safely down. August the 24th, 2001. Air Transat Flight 236 is carrying 306 passengers and crew. Bound for Portugal, the Airbus is in serious trouble high above the Atlantic Ocean. Um, you could literally hear a pin drop. The, the, the exterior, there was no sound in that plane, in that cabin at all. The airplane is so silent because it's run out of fuel. A state-of-the-art jet is now a very heavy glider. The functions we've lost. We have no more stabilizer. Blue and yellow hydraulic. No ADR two and three. No anti skid No reversers. The technology that normally keeps planes flying has deserted the crew. The jet is 10 kilometers in the sky without the most essential instruments. Captain Robert Pichet and co-pilot Dirk de Jagger have to find a way to get it safely back to Earth. For the first four hours of their journey from Canada to Portugal, the flight is unremarkable. We're getting to our next checkpoint. Every 30 minutes across the Atlantic, the crew had checked their position and their fuel consumption against their flight plan. 11.2 tons on the right, 11.2 tons on the left. Despite the computerized systems, some procedures like checking the fuel on board are done by hand. Fuel check complete, levels normal for the distance flown. Right. 
But then a small alarm breaks the air of routine in the cockpit. Look, we're getting a warning signal. Eye temp low and eye pressure high on number two. The computer display shows that the oil temperature is low in engine number two, but it also shows that the oil pressure is high. A low oil temperature indication is normally in indicative of, of bad readings and bad sensor. Uh, oil temperatures don't decrease normally, they increase. A low oil temperature would, would be of no concern. The high oil pressure is, uh, is a very strange indication. Uh, it's, it's very rare. In fact, I've never actually heard of one. The oil readings are so unusual, the pilots believe they might indicate a computer error. But captain and first officer keep monitoring the oil levels. 30 minutes after the first alarm goes off, another warning sounds inside the Airbus. Fuel imbalance warning. Haven't seen that before. Follow our weekend action. I have air traffic control. In the Airbus 330, most of the fuel is contained in large tanks on the wings. The computer had detected that the fuel level on the right is significantly lower than the level on the left. Looking it up in the, the flight manual recommends transferring fuel through a special cross-feed valve. Fuel will then flow from one tank to the other. Once you begin the cross-feeding procedure to correct a fuel imbalance, restorative action should commence quite quickly. Uh, in other words, the situation would not continue to, uh, to get worse. Even though the crew is following proper procedures, the situation does get worse. Fuel quantity isn't rising in the tanks for the right wing. Check fuel quantity. It's very low. Hold on. It's much less fuel than we should have. It looks like a fuel leak. Check again. The systems monitor hundreds and hundreds of sensors, and, uh, you know, they can be affected by, uh, you know, such mundane things as a little bit of uh, frost or ice on a sensor can, can, uh, can cause it to pre present bad data. But in fact, the reading is accurate. There's a serious leak in one of the engines, and Pichet has been transferring precious fuel into the leaking tank. The fact is confirmed when co-pilot De Jagger completes another fuel check. According to the, all the gauges, all the tanks in the right wing are way below the level they should be, according to the flight plan, and, and there's hardly anything in the other ones. What about a trim tank? There's nothing there either. With every passing second, the leak drains the tanks of their remaining fuel until finally the jet is running on empty. We're losing engine number two. I don't believe this. Okay, maximum thrust on number one. Um, what's going on? Uh -oh. Try to transfer fuel from center tank and the trim tank. Transferring. Fuel quantity is reaching zero. This can't be. We're not gonna go completely pride on this airplane. But in fact, the Air Transat has run out of fuel, some 12,000 meters over the Atlantic Ocean. No fuel means no power to control the plane. But the jet has one last trick up its sleeve, one last source of power. The crew deploys a rarely used backup system. It's called a ram air turbine. It will deploy from underneath the fuselage near the wing fairing. And it's, it's, it's a small propeller that deploys out the bottom of the fuselage and it spins in the wind. And that small propeller will provide very limited electrical and hydraulic systems to run the aircraft. In other words, although it's a glider, at least it's a controllable glider. When it took off, this Air Transat jet was a state-of-the-art marvel. Now it's falling from the sky and the crew has to hope this last piece of technology will help them get down in one piece. A passenger plane has run out of fuel. The Air Transat jet is now an enormous glider with more than 300 people on board. 
The crew have diverted their flight from its destination in Portugal. The plane is now heading for a military airbase on the tiny island of Tertiera in the Azores. I saw flight attendants with life jackets in their hand running down the aisles. And obviously that was a, a sign of fear. Um, what, you know, what was happening was the first question that popped in my mind. If Captain Robert Pichet can't make it to the airport, his only other option is the ocean. But Pichet doesn't want to risk it. Planes aren't designed to survive landing on water. In 1996, a Boeing 767 ran out of fuel off the coast of East Africa. Its last moments were caught on amateur video. Of the 175 people on board the Ethiopian Airways jet, only 50 survived. Without vital controls, Captain Pichet and co-pilot Dirk de Jagger have to rely on each other like never before. The thought that a commercial airliner is going to find itself out of fuel with all the safeguards and all the redundancies is hard to fathom. This crew faced it together. Slots out and locked. The very design of the plane prevents it from dropping like a stone. Even without engines, the plane's forward momentum gives it some lift. It's falling fast, but it's still flying. Can you give me a landing speed, please? No engine, no flaps. Ideal approach speed is 170 knots. We're too fast. Yes. But the runway is very long. But at the end of the runway is a very steep cliff. Using the power available from the ram air turbine, Captain Pichet forces the plane to turn steeply, trying to burn off some speed. The plane was almost on a like a 45 degree angle. I thought it was just gonna, it was just gonna flip over and just nosedive straight down. Everybody, I need you to brace. After bursting eight tires, the plane finally stops in the middle of the runway. Everyone on board survives. We got that plane down safely. Only blew out eight of the 12 tires <laughs> and saved 300 people. He saved 300 people's lives. Pichet and De Jagger have flown their Airbus without power further than any passenger jet in history. News of their remarkable achievements spreads around the world. You don't have time really to think about anything else than taking care of the, of the safety of your passenger, you know? That's your main goal, and uh, since we didn't have any engine, the other main goal was to make the landing safely. So at that time, I guess the experience came in. Investigators discover that the leak on board the jet had been set in motion when the right engine had been replaced five days before the crash. We have to realize that there was a small uh, a mistake uh, made uh, in terms of changing the pump. Uh, we installed it, uh, but then uh, some pipes, uh, so to speak, uh, were needed to be connected to the pump, and there was a mismatch. The small mistake had crippled this highly engineered machine. But its very design left the pilots enough control to steer the plane away from disaster. the Delta Connection Academy in Sanford, Florida, another student has earned his wings. After 14 months of training, he's one step closer to becoming a commercial pilot. We don't take everybody here at the academy. We want people that are motivated, that want to come, 
uh, that have a passion for flying. It's uh, a career that you've got to want deep inside to accomplish, otherwise you'll never make it through. Accidents have reinforced the need for pilots to understand the complicated relationship between crew and computers. The lives of countless people depend on it. Pilots take the responsibility for their passengers very, very, very seriously. Uh, we're responsible from the time that that passenger enters the airplane until they leave at the destination. The pilot's always the last line of defense. Automated systems make flying more predictable and dependable. But it's the marriage of computers and crew that ultimately makes flying one of the safest ways to travel. Russia, John F. Kennedy International Airport, one of the busiest in the world. More than 1,200 planes use JFK every day. In the sky, they're stacked up for kilometers, waiting to land. On the ground, dozens more are waiting to take off. The constant stream of airliners can tax the abilities of even the most experienced controllers. The picture, as it's called, that they have to maintain in their head of everything they're controlling, where everybody is, their speed, their altitude, their separation, also includes constant back and forth talking to the pilots. And, and this is a matrix of information flow in and out of their brains. It's just amazing to watch. For the team of air traffic controllers in JFK's tower, it's just another day at work. It's a job that gets more demanding with each passing year. On a busy day in most centers and most departure and arrival controllers, uh, you're saturated. You've got people talking as fast as they can. And that's where errors come in. Over the last decade, there's been a 25% jump in traffic at JFK. And New York's not alone. It's a trend that concerns some industry experts. One of the things that I do as an aviation analyst is try to keep a good lock on what's happening, watch where the weak spots are in the system. If there is another major airline accident, God forbid, it's going to probably originate from an air traffic control problem. The solution to the looming crisis is being developed here, the William J. Hughes Technical Center in New Jersey. It's the workshop of America's Federal Aviation Administration. The center has been involved in every major advance in air transportation system technology since 1958. Airport design, aircraft safety and security, communications, navigation. Scientists at the William Hughes Center have tackled aviation's most difficult problems. Today, this plane is at the heart of one of the largest projects in the history of the FAA. They're using it to design a new air traffic system that will help manage more traffic safely. A two or three-fold increase in the number of aircraft flying is certainly within the, uh, within the range of possibility in the next couple of decades. Together, test pilots and researchers need to figure out a safer way to get airplanes into and out of America's airports. What they've come up with is a system called NextGen. NextGen will supply pilots with the tools and information they need to make many decisions that are now made by controllers. At its heart is a sophisticated piece of equipment that will soon be added not to towers, but to planes. To see if it works, test pilots have to take it for a ride. We're liberating the airplane to do what it's designed to do and not constraining it by our management. Pause break here up. Here it comes. Researchers have installed a revolutionary navigational computer in the back of this executive jet. We're currently flying over Delaware. It's called ADSB. It stands for Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. 
It's a sophisticated GPS receiver that paints a detailed picture of any plane anywhere near this flight. So the pilot has what we call situational awareness of what's flying around him. Uh, the aircraft then broadcasts that position once a second. So any other aircraft flying within RF range of that, that aircraft now knows its position as well. There's nothing like this in any cockpit today. Because it's still experimental technology, the FAA is testing this system in the cabin of the aircraft. If tests like this succeed, it will someday be in the cockpit of every plane in America and eventually around the world. Once the ADSB system is fully operational, everyone will know where you are, how high you're flying, and where you're headed. It's a key piece of the future because it is so accurate. The computer the researchers are putting to the test today is the central element in the most significant retooling of the American air traffic control system in half a century. Human beings cannot be perfect on a sustained basis. We can for certain periods of time. Therefore, we have to expect failure. People make mistakes. It's a lesson the airline industry has learned the hard way, a lesson that fundamentally shaped how planes travel across the skies today. In the few years in which they have been operating, the airlines have discovered that their efforts to improve comforts and services have... After the Second World War, Americans were traveling by air in booming numbers. The earliest air traffic controllers stood next to runways. They waved flags to guide planes in. As traffic increased, pilots also began to use radios to stay in touch with airports. The first air traffic control towers were built as more and more flights had to be handled. Airports had become very busy places, and air traffic was beginning to overwhelm controllers. June the 30th, 1956, Los Angeles International Airport. TWA Flight 2 lifts off eastbound for Kansas City. Airline flying in the 50s was, uh, was really amazing. It, it, was, it was something you dressed up for. Only people who could afford a fairly high price could actually fly. The TWA flight is a Lockheed Super Constellation, one of the most advanced commercial airliners of its time. You won't find any pilot who doesn't think the Super Connie is one of the sexiest airplanes ever designed. Just minutes behind TWA Flight 2, United Airlines Flight 718 takes off from the same airport on its way to Chicago. The system to track both of the planes is far from high tech. The air traffic control center consisted of a room with a map spread out on a table, and the air traffic controllers were moving markers on that map to indicate where each airplane was in its last known position. The pilots radio their position to company dispatchers. Controllers use this information to get a rough idea of their flight paths. They were on radar for a while in Los Angeles, but once they got outside that area, there was no radar. Uh, they were flying under visual flight rules. Uh, the rule is called see and be seen. So I see you, you see me, we stay apart, and we're responsible for our own separation and that except for a few radars in certain parts of the country, controllers didn't really know where the airplanes were. They were estimating on their reports. As the two planes get closer to the Grand Canyon, the distance between them disappears. Both captains were used to showing the canyon off on a clear day. They could move the airplane to the left, move it to the right a little bit, point out the canyon to people and get them to ooh and off. The United flight closes in on the TWA plane from the right unaware their paths are about to cross. People on one side of the DC-7 would have been able to see the oncoming constellation. Could have seen an airplane against an azure sky with fluffy clouds coming closer and closer, and they would have felt the impact. 
The Grand Canyon is a graveyard for 128 passengers and crew of two airliners which crashed on peaks little more than a mile apart. None survived. It was the worst commercial air disaster in history. The Grand Canyon crash created huge banner headlines across the nation and a lot of pressure on the government to do something. We needed radar. We needed to buy it and get it deployed throughout the United States immediately. We had to change the system, and we had to do it fast. The crash killed 128 people and changed the world of air traffic control forever. Following a lengthy investigation, the stark conclusion was that the crash happened because the two planes were outside of so-called controlled airspace. TWA and United collided over the Grand Canyon primarily because neither they nor the control system had the ability to know where both of those airplanes really were. Once the planes left the small area being monitored by controllers, no one was paying attention to where they were. The see and avoid principle is a fraud, and it always has been. The fact is, the faster you go, it's a big sky, you've only got 180 degrees of peripheral vision, and you can't see and avoid everything up there. In the wake of the Grand Canyon accident, American airspace was blanketed by radar. Planes were more stringently confined to air corridors, highways in the sky. The air traffic control system we have in the United States today was designed with the Grand Canyon accident in mind. That crash determined how far apart airplanes should be spaced and where radar dishes and air traffic control centers should be built. It also resulted in the formation of the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA. But now, 50 years later, the system needs to change again. Today, the system falls short of the public's expectations, being congested, slow, clunky, unpleasant. As planes fly faster and higher, it becomes harder for controllers to track their movements. I think in many respects we're in a, a, a very similar situation to where we were in the 50s. The system has to change massively. And the change must happen soon, before we are faced with a major air accident that could take the lives of hundreds of people. The technology on board the FAA flight might be the solution to the overtaxed air traffic control system. Test pilots regularly take to the skies to help researchers prepare the new system for America's airliners. The beautiful thing about ADS-B is, is it gives the pilots in the cockpit and the air traffic controllers basically the same picture. ADS-B is more than a map of other planes. The idea is to show pilots what now only air traffic controllers can see data about the planes that are in a pilot's airspace. With ADS-B, you'll see who that other aircraft is. You'll see an identifier on it. You'll be able to see planes on runways. You'll see planes in the traffic pattern. And you'll get a better feel for what's going on around you, especially if you're on an uncontrolled airport. We can also see uh, map information. We can see navigational aids. We can also see other airports. Giving pilots all that information in the cockpit will allow them to make decisions about how to get to their destinations quickly and safely. The current system relies on radars for the detection and tracking of aircraft. And radar was a great technology in 1940, but fundamentally it's very sloppy. Today, ground-based radar bounces radio signals off an airplane to calculate its position. It can be off by as much as two miles. That's why we keep aircraft three miles or more apart, because we're just not that confident of the, of the solution. With NextGen, an onboard GPS unit will constantly receive signals from a GPS satellite. This will tell pilots where they are, down to within a few hundred feet. With a more accurate picture of airspace, airliners will be able to fly closer together. 
The FAA hopes this will help relieve the congestion at busy airports. Today, only controllers have an accurate picture of air traffic. They use this information to guide pilots around potential problems. The pilots themselves have no way to independently confirm where they are in relation to all other flights. They must rely on controllers to tell them. The weakness of the system was exposed years before next-gen tests began. Labor Day weekend, 1986. Ten o'clock. Approach controller Walter White guides Aeromexico Flight 498 in for a landing at Los Angeles International Airport. The airspace around LAX is very tightly controlled. It's called the TCA, the Terminal Control Area. As Aeromexico Flight 498 closes in on the airport, Walter White sees a plane he does not expect on his radar. Uh, one approach on a flight from Fullerton. Cruising altitude is 4,500. We'd like to follow. OK, you are right in the middle of the TCA, sir. Roman 66 Romeo, I suggest in future you look at your TCA chart. There was an aircraft that was east of the airport, which he became involved in. That was what they called a violator. In many cases, the air traffic that was crawling across his screen, even with transponders, were not reporting altitudes. Walter White hustles the small plane out of the controlled airspace. You just had an aircraft pass right off your left above you at 5,000. And we run a lot of jets right through there at 3,500. But White doesn't realize that there's another plane dangerously off course. We should be able to see the ocean by now. Take a look at the map and, and look around the 4 or 5. A Piper Cherokee is cutting across the approach to LAX, oblivious to the danger. The Aeromexico flight is just minutes from landing. Aeromexico 498. Los Angeles approach. This can't be. The jet plunges towards Cerritos, a suburban community of Los Angeles. Los Angeles approach. I'm sitting there talking with the two departure controllers and uh, not really thinking. And I hear Walter say something like, I think I lost one. Aeromexico 498, Los Angeles approach. That immediately got everybody's attention. So he looked at the radars and could hear him calling Aeromexico 498. The crash devastates the community of Cerritos. 15 people on the ground are killed in the disaster, along with all 64 people on the Aeromexico jet. The Piper Cherokee is found in a nearby schoolyard. All three people on the small plane have been killed. The fact of the matter is that the Cherokee flew into the TCA and hit the DC-9 in restricted airspace without a clearance. The National Transportation Safety Board questions Walter White about what he saw on his radar display. At any time, did you see the Piper Cherokee on your scope? No. No, sir. The Piper's target was not displayed. It is my belief that it was not on my radar scope. He uh, was positive that the aircraft was not there for him to see. But when investigators finally get the air traffic control radar records, they conclude the Piper should have been visible. We were able to determine that the aircraft that collided with Aeromexico was there to be seen. Controllers have been complaining about the radars for a long time. We had reported problems with the radar uh, not picking up targets several times. You may lose one target. You may lose two targets. It may not be presented for one sweep. Did you see the Piper Cherokee on your scope? No, sir. But that doesn't mean that the target isn't there. A blind spot is only an instantaneous 
thing. It's not a continuous thing. He was looking at one and trying to keep it clear. Lost track of another one that just happened to be at the same altitude as the approaching Aeromexico jet. It was a one in a billion chance, but that one in a billion came up that particular day. The collision over Los Angeles drew attention to weaknesses in the radar systems used by air traffic controllers and led to some much needed improvements. Mode C Intruder is an automated program that is now incorporated in all our major radar facilities that if an aircraft should inadvertently intrude, the controller will now be given a visual and an oral alert, thus giving him time to provide a timely warning to the pilot. After the collision over Los Angeles, radar systems at the airport were upgraded. The next generation of air traffic management will only use radar if the GPS system fails. NextGen is also targeting another weakness in the current system, the radio. Today, pilots and controllers use radios to talk to one another. We're now descending to 190 and expecting... The system depends on clear, precise language. Misunderstandings are common, and they've caused some of the most tragic air disasters in history. As the FAA test flight flies high west of Atlantic City, its radio keeps the pilots in touch with controllers. Vector for sequence for the downwind for the runway 2 Okay, 100, uh, clear for the ILS. Uh, we'll but in the air traffic system of the future, pilots and controllers will communicate less frequently. Uh, the controller and the pilot can now work together to resolve issues instead of wasting a lot of time explaining what the issues are. Mistakes can be made for a number of reasons. English is the international language of aviation, but pronunciation, accent, and emotion alter the way any language is spoken. Nowhere is this better understood than in the air traffic control tower at John F. Kennedy International Airport. If you listen on any uh, control frequency, you're going to hear a lot of people say, would you say that again? Say again, over, please. The airspace above JFK is frequented by one of the most international collections of pilots in the world. Maintaining clear radio communications can prove challenging to controllers here. There's pressure because that's the business they're in. The, the business is moving passengers from A to B. That's what the airlines are paid, and the controllers are paid to help that work. When pressure mounts, small misunderstandings can have enormous consequences. January the 25th, 1990. In the skies over New York, to expect for the clearance time in 20 minutes. I think we need priority. We are passing out of fuel. Avianca 052, Roger. Um, how long can you? Avianca hold? Flight 52 is trying to land in New York, but a driving rain is delaying air traffic into and out of the area. The flight began in Colombia. On its way to New York, it's been routed through a series of holding patterns by air traffic controllers. Bad weather is delaying landings all along the northeastern seaboard. There was a system moving through the Great Lakes, moving east. There was a couple other systems converging. And a lot of times they'll converge in the New York area there, and the whole northeast will go down. It's OK if I send four more your way. Uh, Casino, I'm back in the hold again. I, I got four in the stack, and there's no end in sight. Uh, Avianca 052. Yeah, I might be able to get you in right now. Stand by. Thank you. They were progressively moving toward JFK, and they were held in the air for three times. This certainly would put some stress on the crew uh, as to the fact they want to go from A to B. They don't want to fly in a racetrack for an hour just holding. Avianca 052, Roger. And what's your alternate? We said Boston. But uh, we can't do it now. We'd, we'll run out of fuel. The pilots are growing increasingly desperate for clearance to land. Avianca 052 has They've used up almost all of their fuel while waiting their turn. Set him up to his alternate. What is his speed now? Uh, I'm not sure, to be honest. Slow him to 180 knots, and I'll take him. After more than an hour in holding patterns, 
Controllers finally give the pilots of the Avianca flight permission to land. Descend and maintain 3,000. Descend and maintain 3,000. But in this critical handoff from one controller to another, no one mentions that the plane is running out of fuel. Avianca 052 Heavy, contact Kennedy Tower 119.1. Good day. It was extremely important that Avianca 52 landed on their first approach, JFK. The voice recorder revealed that the captain was certainly quite concerned about the fuel state. At JFK, only one runway is being used for landings. Weather at the airport is making approaches difficult. Avionic is 052 Heavy, Kennedy Tower 22 Left. You are number three following 727 traffic on a niner mile final. Avianca 052 Heavy, roger. Avianca 052, say airspeed. 145 knots. Are we clear to land now? Yes, sir, we are clear to land. Stand by. Flaps. The Avianca crew, when they felt okay, it, they were the being handed off to an approach controller now and given a heading in a lower altitude. I'm sure in their minds they thought, well, they even commented on the cockpit voice recorder, we're being handled or we're being taken care of. Four kilometers from runway 22L, and with fuel running dangerously low, the flight hits ferocious winds. They were getting like 60 knots of wind on the nose. And then as they descended on down through about 500 feet to the ground, they were down to 20 knots. So th that's 40 knot change and 1,000 feet of elevation. That's a lot. This is the wind shear. A dramatic change of winds throws the aircraft off its descent path as it makes its approach. Glide slow. Glide slow. Glide slow. The runway, where is it? I don't see it. I don't see it. The plane is thrown towards the ground by the winds. The airplane was about 200 feet above the ground, about two miles from the runway, which was well below the glide slope and very dangerous. So the, the airplane almost crashed on its first approach. Give me the landing gear up, landing gear up. When you get a missed approach, it changes the whole ball game. Request another traffic pattern. Executing a missed approach, Avianca 052 Heavy. The fuel tanks aboard Avianca Flight 52 are all but empty. Another approach on the airport will be nearly impossible. Controllers in New York will have to try once more to get Avianca Flight 52 safely to the ground. That's right, to 180 on the heading, and uh, we'll try once again. We are running out of fuel. These guys were out, and they didn't say we were out. And he allowed the approach control to vector them way out in the original pattern and 15 miles north of the outer marker again. Advise him, we are in an emergency. Do you tell him? Yes, sir, I already advised him. But the first officer neglects to use the word emergency in his radio transmissions to the tower. He only mentions that his fuel is low. 052 Heavy, contact approach on 118.4. Approach, Avianca 052 Heavy. We and it was apparent from the voice recorder transcript and tape that the captain was not understanding the first officer's radio communications that were being made in English. Engine number four. The engines quit when they're finally starved of fuel. Flame out on engine number three. Show me the runway. We just uh, lost two engines and we need priority, please. Avianca 052. Turn left heading 250. Intercept the local line. Without engine power, Avianca Flight 52 crashes into a residential neighborhood on Long Island. Avianca 052, radar contact lost. Yes, hello. I live in Cove Neck in Oyster Bay, and there is a plane crashed in our uh, yard in front of our house. 85 of the 158 people on board survive the crash. Throughout the night, rescue workers pull them from the wreckage. Investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board arrive within hours. 
they remove the cockpit voice recorder from the wreckage. The condition of the aircraft was really astonishing to see that that much of the structure was left in the condition that it was in. It hit right on a, about a 28 degree embankment and with the wings and all the other trees, it only slid 28 feet, so it hit and stopped uh, instantly. The NTSB investigation reveals that controllers didn't transmit vital information to one another. Radio communication, one of the most vital parts of air traffic control, failed the passengers and crew. Trying to avoid those kinds of mistakes is a key component of next gen. Radio communication will largely be replaced by an exchange of electronic data. Automation is extremely important, and in the future, it's going to be able to get rid of the type of errors that occur when you put massive pressure on a human being to be 100% perfect. With the elimination of radio chatter, air traffic control towers of the future will be very quiet places. Controllers on the ground will still be needed to move planes in and out of airports. But with more accurate information at their disposal and less need to talk to pilots, they'll be able to handle far more flights than they do today. 040. On board the FAA's flight, the new GPS-based technology gets the ultimate test. Without any warning from air traffic control. You see him, Dan? No, I don't see him yet. There he goes. Oh, there he is. They notice another plane, just 400 feet below. In the back of the jet, the next-gen system detects the other plane. Had the system been in the cockpit, it would have shown the pilots its precise location. Without it, they rely on a piece of technology called TCAS to warn them of the danger. Using signals transmitted from plane to plane, the traffic collision avoidance system warns pilots when other planes are too close. Uh, TCAS gives the pilot a traffic advisory at 45 seconds before the potential collision, and then at approximately 25 seconds or so before the potential collision, a resolution advisory is given to actually tell the pilots to climb or descend to avoid the altitude of the other aircraft. And normally, air traffic will call that to us, but yeah, they didn't yeah. even call the traffic, no. so that TCAS helped a lot. TCAS can help pilots of approaching planes avoid collisions. But with the new system, pilots will be able to prevent their planes from getting dangerously close in the first place. You know, with ADS-B, we're going to be able to see that traffic on the display. So the avionics can have smarts built into it to warn the pilot when he's approaching another aircraft. Today, the system works perfectly. The pilots of the test flight see the danger and avoid it. TCAS can help pilots avoid a collision, but having it on board is no guarantee that an accident won't happen. September the 29th, 2006. A small business jet flies high above the Brazilian countryside. The pilots will fly to Manaus in Brazil before taking off again for New York City. In the cockpit, co-pilot Jan Palladino is having trouble maintaining radio contact with air traffic controllers. He tries different channels, but still no one responds to his radio calls. It's unusual for pilots and air traffic controllers to be out of contact for such an extended period of time. Brasilia, November 600, X-ray, Lima. November 600, X-ray. Finally, after 12 attempts, Palladino gets through to controllers. No, set. Contact one, two, three, one, two, six, small, four, five. Sorry, say frequency one more time for November 600, X-ray, Lima. But Palladino can't understand the garbled radio transmission. Brasilia, November 600, X-ray, Lima. Then the signal disappears altogether. 
the jet follows the Brasilia Air Corridor en route to Manaus. But traffic along this corridor runs in both directions. The airway system between Brasilia and Manaus is very simple. It makes airplanes fly northbound, maintaining even levels, and airplanes flying southbound, maintaining odd levels. A little more than two hours into the flight, disaster strikes. The concussion itself seemed to affect every atom in my body. The end of the wing was chopped off and it was serrated. It looked like it had been chewed off. The legacy jet has struck an oncoming Boeing 737. Goal flight 1907. With 154 people on board, the goal flight spirals out of control. The pilots of the smaller jet don't know what they've hit, but their business jet is still flyable. Sit down back there. I got it, I got it, I got it. Just let me fly the thing, dude. All right. We're descending, I want to get down. Okay, it's yours, it's yours. The crew locates a runway at a military base in the middle of the jungle. November 600 X-ray Lima declaring an emergency. We need to land at Sierra Bravo Charlie Charlie. Is that your airport? Affirmative. The pilots of the executive jet attempt an emergency landing. Here we go. Hold it. Let's dump the flaps at the top of the flare, right? So give me nine flare, on right? the flare. So you give me nine. Yeah, you, we got, nine. Flare, you yeah? got nine. Everyone sit down back there. When you land under those sort of circumstances, you're landing faster than you normally would. You're coming down like gangbusters. Good. You got it. Hold it. You're good. Woo! <laughs> good job. Oh, man. Oh. <laughs> At Brasilia Air Traffic Center, Controllers have lost track of goal flight 1907. Manaus, there isn't any goal. I can't see anything here. It's on its way. So it's already in my area? For over half an hour. Anxiety was high, and controllers were confused about what to say. They didn't know what was happening. Troops locate the wreckage of goal flight 1907 deep in the Amazon jungle. There are no survivors. Investigators learn that the legacy jet and the goal flight were flying along the same air corridor in opposite directions. 1,000 feet of altitude is supposed to separate them. Investigators interview the pilots of the business jet. We are proceeding northwest on course to Manaus at 37,000 feet. OK, we are attempting to contact Brazilian control. Did you say you were flying at 37,000 feet? Yes, that's right. Flight level 370. We never moved from that. The pilots of the executive jet filed a flight plan in which they would fly at 37,000 feet until they reached Brasilia. There, they would descend to 36,000. The flight plan calls for you to descend to 360 at Brasilia. Why didn't you? We weren't told to. Before we took off, we were cleared for 370 all the way to Manaus. That's what we did, sir. Uh, I don't know Air traffic doing. control can always deviate from the flight plan because they have best knowledge of the actual traffic situation. We were not told to descend, and we did not descend. Once we knew for sure that both planes were flying at the same altitude, we knew there would be a lot to investigate on the side of air traffic control. Can you call up the legacy jet screen for me? On the radar screen, we see the altitude, the speed, and the transponder information of each plane. Images show investigators what air traffic controllers saw on their radar screen before the accident. One symbol stands out. The set on the air traffic controller screens indicates that the airplane 
he's looking at has lost its transponder. Roger. Transponders give controllers exact information on the altitude of the flights they monitor. Investigators learned that the transponder aboard the Legacy had been turned off. Possibly due to the captain's inexperience with the new jet. Still working out the kinks on how to work this flight management. Without information coming from the jet's transponder, the air traffic computer displays the altitude the plane is supposed to be at, according to the flight plan. But it's actually flying 1,000 feet higher, right in the path of the goal flight. The Brazilian controllers did not verify the legacy jet's real altitude. Nobody did anything from the ground, which is where we expect it to happen, to save these two airplanes from being head-on at the same altitude. Back over Atlantic City, pilots are preparing to bring their test flight in for a landing. Today, the flight has to stay within tightly confined boundaries set out by air traffic controllers. But when all aircraft are equipped with ADS-B, that won't be the case. If the aircraft could fly on a path that was optimum for them and optimum for the traffic system, we could use a lot more of the airspace than we do today. We're going to have airplanes flying directly to where they need to fly and computers keeping them apart. At the FAA, researchers have been designing systems that get flights from A to B in a whole new way. Right now, there's no way for controllers to know the exact location of a plane. That's why flights are confined to preset highways to keep them from colliding. With GPS-based NextGen, a pilot can follow any route he chooses provided there aren't any other planes in his path. He can choose a much more direct route to his destination. If we could have airplanes going in all directions and more efficiently directly to where they want to go, uh, we would be able to double, triple, maybe even quadruple the number of aircraft that we could safely handle in the skies at one time. By charting their own route, ADSB will allow pilots to keep a safe distance from other planes without having to stick to a preset highway in the sky. Maintaining that distance is important because even the best technology can't keep airplanes apart. July 2002. Bashkirian Airlines Flight 2937 cruises westbound through the night sky for Barcelona. The Tupolev 154M carries 69 people. Most of the passengers are Russian children traveling on a summer holiday. Meanwhile, a DHL cargo aircraft travels north towards Brussels. The two flights are supposed to pass each other over Lake Constance in southern Germany. Climb flight level. But air traffic controllers have failed to notice that both flights are at the same altitude. The controller is distracted by another flight. At a second station, he assists a late arrival. What is your present heading? It was a standard practice at the ATC company that at night, one air traffic controller was responsible for controlling the entire airspace of ATC Zone. Aboard the Tupolev, the pilots have spotted an intruder. Look, look at that. And it's closing in, fast. 500 meters. On board the DHL cargo plane, the TCAS computer is issuing an urgent warning. Defend. The system Defend. is designed to warn pilots of an oncoming flight. Increase descent. And what to do to avoid collision. 600. TCAS descent. When the air traffic controller returns to his position, he sees the conflict. The flights will cross paths in less than a minute. Descend flight level 350. Expedite, I have crossing traffic. The Russian captain obeys the controller's instruction to descend. 
but his TCAS system is telling him to climb. Climb. It says climb. Climb. The Russian crew has 35 seconds to decide whether to obey the air traffic controller or the computer. Level three. Climb. 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 Descend. Level three five zero. Expedite descent. Climb. He's guiding us down. We're not accustomed to not trusting controllers. In civil aviation, there were lots of situations when pilots didn't follow instructions of the controller, and that led to plane crashes or other accidents. Expedite descent level. Under pressure, with just seconds to decide, the Russian pilots follow the controller's direction. At the same time, the DHL jet is also descending. Increase descent. Increase descent. Increase! He's going below us! Increase, climb! Increase, Close climb! Close it! Peter, climb! Climb, Fist! Climb! Descend! Descend hard! Bravo Tango Charlie 2937. Bravo Tango Charlie. Both flights crash near Lake Constance in Germany. 71 people are killed. There are no survivors. The collision leaves air traffic experts at a critical crossroads. If I have to summarize the advice that we gave the world. If a warning comes from ACAS, pilots should immediately follow it at all times. If the Russian pilots had followed the computer's instructions, the accident would not have happened. With the benefit of hindsight, you always ask yourself, could we have done more? And an accident is a wake-up call for everybody. The disaster highlighted the potential value of automated systems and proved again how fatal human errors can be. It's an important lesson for the developers of next-gen. Technology can provide humans with information, but can't control what they do with it. Over Atlantic City, the FAA jet is on its final approach. Runway is clear. Bring the flaps to uh, 60. Its two-hour test flight has brought NextGen one step closer to being installed on commercial airplanes. Nice job, guys. Two reversers. Speed's at 90. I got the yoke. When ADS-B is everywhere and the data is being displayed in the cockpit, that will allow the airlines to fly hugely more efficiently. Over the past 50 years, air traffic control has evolved tremendously. <laughs> Human error. Technical difficulties. And poor communication have taken the lives of hundreds of people and uncovered deadly weaknesses in the current system. Today, those weaknesses are one step closer to being fixed. I think the next-gen system, as it has evolved now, is really going to be excellent. It's going to start in the direction that we need to go for the future. The elements that make up next-gen will be introduced slowly over the next decade. Piece by piece, a whole new system of air traffic control will take shape in the US and ultimately around the world. That's what airplane people do. They uh, react to the challenge and develop a new way of flying. If next gen lives up to its promise, that new way will mean fewer delays and ultimately fewer accidents. It's early December. A massive winter storm is pounding the eastern United States. Well, this is a pretty interesting weather pattern we have for this time of year. We're getting uh, a mixed bag of uh, precipitation and, and weather across the eastern United States. 
For most people, the winter weather is no more than an inconvenience. But for those who fly, the bad weather can be deadly. A Continental Airlines commuter plane with 48 people aboard crashed into a home in suburban Buffalo. No survivors, one person on the ground also killed. The plane was en route from Newark to Buffalo. It was raining with some sleet at the time. People are making life and death decisions every day uh, based on the weather. Should I go or should I not go today? And, and once they're up in the air, how am I going to make a decision in the next five minutes that's going to keep myself, my passengers, or my aircraft uh, out of harm's way? On this day, flights from New York to Houston have been delayed and canceled. Thousands of travelers are affected. That's largely because the people in this room have decided that it is unsafe for pilots to fly in this weather. Our mission here is, is to provide safety and safe flying. What's happening now, it's an existing condition, so. It's like some mm -hmm. discreet supercells in there. This room is every pilot's first line of defense against getting caught in a storm. It's the federal government's aviation weather center in Kansas City, Missouri. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the meteorologists in this room scan the skies across the United States for the kind of weather that can bring down a plane. The storm they're tracking today is just that kind of weather. What we're monitoring is a lot of severe weather in the uh, Carolinas and uh, continuing to get severe thunderstorm warnings and tornado warnings there. The meteorologists have detected thunderstorms moving towards Atlanta, Georgia. They've warned pilots and air traffic controllers of the looming danger. The result is immediate. So you had, you had planes that were on the ground that could not take off. Uh, then you had planes that were arriving that were unable to land. And then you have to factor in that they were going several hundred miles around this, this line of thunderstorms. The meteorologists will track this storm throughout the day. They know weather can change in an instant. So they're not just tracking storm systems, they're also trying to predict where new storms are going to develop. We've got to keep our eye on every hazard and, and always be pre prepared for it to pop up. Today, the people who work here also have to find a way to keep planes out of the storms that are rolling through the south. As traffic managers, we need to work with the FAA in, in routing safe routes for aircraft to go around those thunderstorms because they just can't go through them or over them. So using these two images together, we can get a, a good three-dimensional or even four-dimensional picture of the atmosphere and how moisture is moving around in there. Thunderstorms are a lethal threat to pilots. The clouds that contain them are massive. They're usually much too tall to fly over and the weather inside them can be treacherous. In no instance does any aircraft want to go into a thunderstorm. Uh, lightning strikes, hail can certainly damage uh, the airframe, uh, and in, in the extreme cases, there can be so much liquid precipitation in that thunderstorm that it'll cause a jet engine to flame out. The meteorologists here understand the danger of thunderstorms, and one devastating crash has taught them much of what they know. It's April the 4th, 1977. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. May I see your boarding pass, please? Southern Airways Flight 242 is bound for Atlanta, Georgia. Just down the aisle on the right, sir. Enjoy your flight. Thank you. Boarding pass. Here in the United States, the weather in the southeast usually consists of high humidity and high temperature. That's a perfect recipe for thunderstorms. It was raining in Huntsville, and they said, oh, it's going to be some bad weather. Don't serve. So we did not serve from Huntsville to Atlanta, which is a very short route. And we were delighted not to be serving. Aircraft dispatchers provide flight crews with pre-flight weather information. Looks like you guys got a good one coming. Sure thing. Have a good one. That weather was two hours old. It was no longer updated. I was a little surprised that we took off when we did. I really thought we'd taxi out to the end of the runway and hold for a while because the weather looked so bad. But we taxied out and immediately took off. 
Before the pilots get very far, they receive an ominous weather warning from air traffic control. Southern Airways 242, I'm painting a line of weather which appears to be moderate to possibly heavy precipitation. Starting about five miles ahead. Uh, okay, uh, we're in the rain right now. Uh, it doesn't look much heavier than what we're in right now, does it? Back in 1977, pilots were more reliant on their own skills, abilities, and knowledge than they were on air traffic control. In this particular instance, they had onboard weather radar. I can't read that. It just looks like rain, Bill. What do you think? There's a hole. There's a hole right there. That's all I see. Pilots use their radar to avoid bad weather. They stay away from regions that are illuminated on the display screen. Coming over, we had pretty good radar. I believe right straight ahead. There. The next few miles is probably the best way we can go. So between that information and looking out the window, they were able to make what they believed were the right decisions about traversing the weather. As the pilots of Southern Airways Flight 242 attempt to carve a path through the thunderstorms, they encounter a wall of storm cells. It looks heavy. Nothing's going through that. The storm closes in on the aircraft. That's a hole, isn't it? It's not showing a hole, is it? The gap between the Thunderheads the pilots thought they had seen on their radar no longer seems to exist. Pilots don't like thunderstorms in any way, shape, or form, only because it poses a threat to the safe operation of the airplane. Because of the high velocity winds, the potential for hail, wind shear, that all has a dramatic effect on the capabilities of not only the pilot, but of course the aircraft as well. The uh, hail was probably the loudest noise I've ever heard. It sounded like I was in a metal barrel with someone throwing rocks at me. The DC-9 plunges into the storm clouds. Which way do we cross here or go out? I don't know how we get through here, Bill. Enormous hailstones continue to pound the aircraft. You're just going to have to go out. Yeah, right across that bed. All clear left, approximately right now. The pilots try to escape the storm. They use their radar to guide them through it. I think we can cut across there. But their radar is deceiving them. What they think is a hole is in fact the most intense part of the storm ahead. The pilots of Southern Airways 242 ended up flying into an environment where multiple thunderstorms came, came together and created a line or what they call a squall line. That's an area of fast-moving thunderstorms. The weather system is moving very quickly, and that created not only tornadoes, but high-velocity winds and hail. OK, uh, 242, uh, we just got our windshield busted. We'll try to get it back up to 15. We're at 14. While I was looking out at the front of the left engine, I could see the hail continuing to put more and more dents into the cowling around the engine and into the cone in the center of the engine and the engine was starting to make sounds like it was quitting. The torrent of hail and water overwhelms the engines of the DC-9. It clogs the critical airflow passages and causes the engines to break apart. Left engine won't spool. Our left engine just cut out. You say you lost an engine and uh, busted a windshield? Uh, yes, sir. My god. The other engine's going, too. Got the other engine going, too. Southern 242, say again. Stand by. We lost both engines. What happens next leads to one of the most horrific crashes in aviation history and spurs fundamental changes to the way weather forecasts are made. Brace for High above Georgia, Southern Airways Flight 242 is falling from the sky. We lost both engines. This DC-9 is a glider, and it's falling at 56 feet per second. They're at 14,000 feet. They don't have a lot of time. I realized I was in an emergency situation, and I felt like I was going to die. But I decided I would do everything I could to try to help my chances. 
The plane emerges from the storm with two dead engines. Get those engines started. Billy, you have to find me a highway. Let's get the next clear open field. No, Bill. Lyman Keel is a young man who has just come back from the proving ground of Southeast Asia, where he was a naval aviator. He learned the niceties of landing on a rolling, pitching aircraft carrier in the South China Sea in the middle of the night. What he was confronted with right now was even a greater test, the greatest test he had ever confronted in his life as an airman. Flaps. They're down to 50. Unable to restart the engines, Lyman Keel prepares to land his aircraft on Georgia State Highway 92 without power. I'm gonna land right over that guy. There's a car ahead. I got it. I got it now. I got it. The aircraft touches down on the highway running through the town of New Hope, Georgia. Before the plane completely stopped moving, there was fire blowing through the cabin. The plane clips a utility pole. And slams into a gas station. Where I found myself after we woke up, sort of indescribable. And I could see a crack of light, and I thought, I'm going through that crack of light, come hell or high water. <laughs> I saw a red reflection like fire in the door. That's when I saw what was happening. I saw smoke and fire. And the people that were coming toward me, they weren't screaming, they weren't yelling, they were quiet. I got back to the kitchen and I was just circled by people. They knew they were in a house and I guess they felt safe and they needed somebody to help them. And I, I'll remember to the day I die just staring there at the you know, trees burning and pine trees burning and pieces of aircraft. It, it's, it was so um, unreal. 22 people survived the crash of Flight 242. 72 people were killed. Southern Flight 242 crashed after the DC-9 jet lost power in both engines. The tragedy involving Flight 242 was avoidable had the crew been provided up-to-date weather information when they were in Huntsville. Had they had an understanding of the area of thunderstorms, how they were starting to come together, and how it was going to affect their route of flight, they probably either would have found an alternate place to go or they would have stayed in Huntsville. The importance of timely weather information makes the Aviation Weather Center critical. After Southern Airways 242 crash in 1977, the NTSB uh, after their research, came out with two recommendations. One was to improve the resolution of the convective or the thunderstorm forecast information. And the other was to put uh, weather service meteorologists in each of the air traffic control centers. And within a year, we did that. At the time of the Southern Airways crash, the weather center issued thunderstorm advisories every four hours. And in the United States, that's just too long of a window to capture the rapid development that we see in thunderstorms. So what they, re they recommended, and which we have done ever since, is communicate to controllers and to pilots that are en route every hour. And if need be, we can do it in between those hourly observations if conditions are developing fast enough. As a result of the crash, the Weather Center created a new position, a meteorologist who does nothing but monitor the skies above the United States for thunderstorms. On this December day, the meteorologists tracking thunderstorms are very busy. Storms that had battered Atlanta are on the move. And you can see up in here, 
there's a minimum of, of aircraft, especially where those heavier storms were over eastern North Carolina. In addition to providing weather reports, the people here perform other crucial tasks. When the weather gets bad enough, they can also shut down huge areas of airspace. They do that by issuing warnings called SIGMETs. It's short for Significant Meteorological Information. It's an advisory to pilots to steer clear of the bad weather. Right now on radar. Once we become aware or, or are highly confident that, that there will be some dangerous weather, there severe turbulence or severe icing, then we will issue what's called the SIGMET. What do I want the pilots to do? I want them to avoid that area. The lightning it's still pretty recent, so. Today's storms are so severe that the meteorologists at the Aviation Weather Center are declaring areas of airspace out of bounds for aircraft. We issued a large area from um, Norfolk down through the uh, coastal waters of Georgia for severe thunderstorms. Issuing a SIGMET is simple. The meteorologists highlight the area that planes are to avoid on their computers. The information is passed on to dispatchers, air traffic controllers, and pilots around the country. Planes are diverted immediately. Now, some of those uh, planes going through there may be going around. They may be uh, being helped by air traffic control to actually navigate around those individual thunderstorm cells. No doubt that, that uh, they're being routed either away from or individually being very carefully uh, tactically moved around those thunderstorm cells. The SIGMET issued by the Aviation Weather Center affects hundreds of flights along the eastern seaboard. Once it's issued, pilots often have to find a way around the danger zone. It's no longer just a suggestion. There are legal uh, consequences to people to uh, adhere to what, we, what we've put out. They're just legally not allowed to go into that airspace while that SIGMET's in effect. Declaring a SIGMET has enormous implications shutting down a, a volume of space that's the size of, say, Georgia. So that severely impacts traffic. The FAA and the air traffic controllers now need to decide how they're going to, as a system, move these routes and these aircraft, which can be hundreds of them in this, operating in this space, around this particular hazard uh, over the next four to six or even longer hours. Planes can fly around the area affected by a SIGMET, but that increases travel time and costs the airlines in extra fuel. The alternative is to keep planes on the ground until the SIGMET is lifted. They may increase safety, but SIGMETs are a headache for airlines and air traffic controllers. It averages out about 7,000 planes to 8,000 planes at any moment being managed. And so uh, when you start shutting down large areas of airspace, which we certainly can do on a very active thunderstorm day, uh, it leaves very little operating room for air traffic controllers to put planes through. Technology allows the meteorologists here to keep planes away from dangerous weather. But in aviation, some of the most dangerous weather is all but invisible. August the 2nd, 1985. 10 degree flaps, please. Delta Airlines Flight 191 is approaching Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport. For takeoff. Contact departure, wind airborne. Texas heat has turned into afternoon storms. Traffic at the airport is beginning to back up as the weather gets worse. We're going to get our airplane washed. What? We're going to get our airplane washed. Nothing seemed unusual other than the fact that we were starting to get busy and aircraft were starting to pile up. Tower, Delta 191 Heavy, out here in the rain. Feels good. 191 Heavy. We're not getting any bad warnings from the weather or from other pilots, which we rely on as they come through it. As the pilots of Delta 191 prepare for landing, the rain begins to fall harder. It seemed like the closer we got in the DFW, the worse the weather got. And it was turning it into the, the rain instead of going around it. At the foot of the runway, one of the most ferocious types of storm clouds stands in their way. 
Before landing, check. Landing gear. Down, three green. At the time, the type of storm the Delta crew is approaching barely has a name. John McCarthy is one of the world's leading experts on these storms. It is a tiny thing, meteorologically speaking, compared to a, a big storm or a snowstorm or a hurricane. It's just a, like a needle in a haystack. The needle is a microburst, one of the deadliest and at the time most poorly understood weather phenomena. They've taken down airliners before. But as Delta 191 makes its approach, there are no warning systems that can effectively alert the pilots of the danger they're in. Prior to 1985, the radars on board the aircraft were built to detect thunderstorms, uh, essentially heavy areas of precipitation. They were not effective. They were not even designed to detect the microburst. If you're at the kitchen sink and you turn on the water and it goes straight down and it splashes out in all directions. And that's kind of what a microburst is, except that it is extremely bad news if you're an airplane flying through it. When a plane hits a microburst, it encounters a complex and powerful set of conditions. Downdrafts and tailwinds batter a plane. It's a deadly combination. At its maximum strength, it's, it's no more than two miles across. And it lasts no more than 15 minutes. So if you look at that little space and time window, it's very small. And so the probability of hitting one is low. Just short of the runway, Delta 191 flies into the microburst. You're going to lose it all of a sudden. There it is. Push it up. Push it way up. Way up. Way up. Way up. I pulled my seatbelt tight as I could, but, but at the same time, you could hear a pin drop. Nobody was talking. Hang on to the son of of Delta Flight 191 did their very best to recover from this situation, and it didn't work out. I must have caught sight of him just at the last millisecond, and he cartwheeled into the tank in just an instant, and then, of course, there was fire, not a ball of fire, but a wall of fire. It seemed like it was only a few seconds, five seconds at the most. I don't know how long it was. We was, everything was stopped. Then all of a sudden you look up and it's just nothing there. It's, everything's gone. You just see the whole big picture outside. Like the plane just opened up. People just thrown around on, on the ground. Some were clothes on, some without clothes on, some were burned. Just 27 people survived the crash of Delta 191. Help! Over here! 137 people are killed. I had seen death before as a medic in Vietnam, but it had never been aimed at civilians, and certainly not on a mass casualty situation, and certainly not this suddenly. It's hard to blame the air crew. Their job is to avoid thunderstorms, and there's probably a forecast for thunderstorms every day at Dallas in the summertime. Which ones do you avoid? And it's, you know, it's, it's a very difficult problem. After the crash of Delta 191, the Federal Aviation Administration races to develop technology that can prevent microbursts from killing again. If there is one crash that we can look back on now and say, this made things safer because we learned from it, it was Delta 191. One of the most important lessons, that the technology in use at the time simply wasn't good enough. 
What we found out is that DAPA radar, which is on the ground, is incredibly effective in detecting microbursts. Unlike weather radar in use at the time of the crash of Delta 191, Doppler radar can also detect the direction of winds inside a storm. And if you look through the Doppler radar, you see a part of it that's going away from the radar and a part that's coming towards the radar. And if it's small, it's absolutely a microburst. It can be nothing else. So it has what we call an unambiguous signature of a microburst, which means we got it. When the Doppler radar system at an airport detects a microburst, it sends an alert to air traffic controllers. The controllers relay the warning to pilots on approach. Flight 236, microburst alert. 5 0 knot lost, one mile final, say intentions. After the crash of Delta 191, terminal Doppler weather radar was installed in airports across the United States. Dallas Fort Worth was one of the first to apply the system. But technology is only one link in the chain. Sometimes, even with all the right information, pilots make disastrous decisions. There's your big wad diddly. Yeah, we gotta get over there real quick. This December day has been a long one for thousands of airline passengers across North America. A winter storm is moving across the southeastern United States. The meteorologists at the Aviation Weather Center have shut down a large area of airspace. Hundreds of flights have been grounded or forced to divert around the storm. But shutting down that airspace doesn't take the pressure off. If thunderstorms do start to develop and become very strong and organized, we can't let that distract us from other hazards such as icing, turbulence, or even strong surface winds or low-level wind shear. The meteorologists here can see troubling weather ahead and let pilots know how to avoid it. But sometimes what pilots do with that information can lead to disaster. June the 1st, 1999. American Airlines Flight 1420 has been delayed by weather. Dispatch, please. Yeah, it's Michael Oregon. Storms threaten this flight's destination. Little Rock National Airport in Arkansas. The pilots of 1420 had received a briefing from their dispatch department about all of the thunderstorm activity that they were going to encounter between Dallas and Little Rock. They were also warned about the fact that because of the fast-moving weather system that they would be entering into an area called or what was characterized as the bowling alley. Two hours behind schedule, the pilots decide to make the flight. They race to fly through a gap in the storm system. Whoa, looks like it's moving this way though. Yeah, just some lightning straight ahead. I think we're gonna be okay though, right there. Yep, right down the bowling alley. As my friends would say, California cool. Cool, beachy, exactly. If they don't make it in time, they will either have to divert to another airport or land in severe weather conditions. They were made aware by dispatchers that they were going to have to get into this alley or this area of clear weather, and they didn't have a lot of time to do it. But as they near the airport, the weather gets even worse. American 1420, it appears we have a second part of the storm moving through. The wind now is 340 at 16 gust 34. Okay, did you notice something? Did you see the airport there? Where? There, okay. You're right. You're on a base for it, okay? It's it's right there. Well, I'm on a base now. It's it's like a dog leg. We're coming in and and, and there it is, right there. I, I lost it. I don't, I don't see how we can maintain visual. The plane was rocking and rolling at that point. It was pretty doggone unstable. I don't know what made me aware, so doggone aware, that we were going to have a problem. I don't know what did that.
One of the things that we analyzed was a statement by the captain that was recorded on the cockpit voice recorder. See, I, I hate droning around visual at night and weather without having any clue where we are. It gave us an indication that they didn't have situational awareness. They didn't really understand the gravity of the environment that they were flying into. Uh, American 1420. Right now we have heavy rain on the airport. Uh, I don't have new weather for you, but uh, visibility is less than a mile. And the runway 4 right RVR is 3,000. As the pilots of American Airlines Flight 1420 attempt to land, visibility has been reduced even further. The wind's now 350 at 30 gusts 45. Can we land? 030 at 45, American 1420. 3000 RVR, we can't land on that. No, 3000 if what you What do we need? At... No, it's 2400 RVR. OK, right. Yeah, we're fine. The stress level of a pilot increases, especially in an environment where there's thunderstorms, only because multiple decisions are having to be made in very short periods of time. Uh, 15. Landing gear down. And lights, please. The pilots could divert to another airport, but they decide to attempt the landing. Air traffic controllers have detected a dangerous crosswind on the runway. Wind shear alert. Uh, center field wind 350 at 32 gusts 45. North boundary wind 310 at 29. Northeast boundary wind 320 at 32. 1,000 feet. 20. 40 40 land. This, this is a can of worms. Wind is 330 at 28. I'm going to stay above it a little. There's a runway off to your right. You got it? No. I got the runway in sight. You're right on course. I got it. Stay where I you got are. it. I got it. Wind 330 at 2-3. Damn, we're off course. No, I can't see it. Way off. I can't see anything. Got it? Got it. With winds pounding the airport and the feet. runway slick with rain, the pilots make their final approach. 40. 30. 20. 10. We're down. We're sliding. Oh, no. They lose control of the aircraft as they speed down the runway. On the brakes. Help me. Other one. Other one, other one. The plane runs off the end of the runway and crashes into several steel columns. Well, I, knew I was not going to die in that thing. I got out of that plane probably in 10 seconds. It's like being in war. Go, go, go. But not everyone is so lucky. 11 people are killed in the crash of American Airlines Flight 1420, including Captain Richard Bushman. Did they really know what they were getting themselves into? That was a key point for us as investigators. They went into an environment that was detrimental to their safety. The National Transportation Safety Board rules that the pilot's decision to land at Little Rock Airport was the primary cause of the accident. On the day of the crash, the pilots of Flight 1420 had to rely on controllers to relay information about conditions on the runway. At the Aviation Weather Center, meteorologists are trying to get rid of that middleman. We can provide a picture right in the uh, cockpit, and the pilot can navigate uh, looking at a picture as opposed to trying to translate uh, some words that they've heard read to them over a radio. They can see what the hazard's going to be in relation to aircraft and start making decisions immediately as opposed to decoding, drawing where that hazard is, thinking about where they are in relation to the hazard, and then trying to make that decision. It will speed up the process. Throughout the day, meteorologists in this room have been tracking a band of fierce thunderstorms in the southern United States. Those storms are beginning to die down. 
meteorologists have started to reopen airspace they had previously closed. Air traffic is returning to normal. The most active convective weather was over eastern North Carolina uh, and southward. Now there is a lot of uh, lower topped precipitation that doesn't have thunderstorms and they're more than likely if they're going up uh, across western North Carolina and, and central Virginia, they're able to pretty much fly over that weather. The thunderstorms in the southern United States are dying down. But the meteorologists are now keeping a close eye on a very dangerous new development. A volcano south of the United States. Volcanic ash clouds can be a hazard and do a lot of damage to the aircraft and to engines. Nolan Duke is tracking weather over the Gulf of Mexico. This is Sufer Hills. This is near Antigua and the, and the, and the Windward Islands, south, southeast of, uh, of Puerto Rico. And uh, it blew its stack. Sufria Hills volcano has been venting ash for the past week. The volcanic ash cloud it's been releasing could prove deadly if pilots were to fly through it. The Aviation Weather Center has issued a SIGMET to keep planes away from the plume. Each one of these frames is an hour. And by sunrise, the volcanic ash cloud is this little milky region right in here. Sometimes it's very difficult to discern between the ash clouds and the meteorological clouds, but a well-trained eye with a lot of experience, we'll see this ash cloud. We have 30,000 people living on platforms, drilling platforms out here at any given time. And they have 650 air, uh, helicopters that fly every day up or over the northern Gulf of Mexico, delivering people, materials, and food to keep these, these drilling operations going. We thought it would end yesterday, and they forecasted it to puff and, and disappear, but it's still going today. As long as we can see uh, ash plume, we will uh, continue to issue the SIGMED. Unlike ash that you might see in a chimney or after a fire in a forest, this is not soft material at all. This is very fine, ground-up particles of solid rock and minerals. But that fine dust has the power to stop a 300-ton airliner. On June the 24th, 1982, the devastating effects of an ash cloud took the crew of a British Airways jet completely by surprise. Barry and I were just sitting there minding the shop. Pitch dark night, of course. And then we started to get these pinpricks of light on the, on the windscreen. Mount Galangang on the island of Java has erupted, but no warnings have been issued to pilots. When the 747 flies into the cloud, it collides with the volcanic ash particles inside. The friction creates a bright shimmering glow on the windscreen. Because it's such a dry environment up there, that frictional electrification produces the glow that we refer to as St. Elmo's fire. Same on my side. But the crew had no idea what they were looking at. This uh, light show, if you like, had become more intense. In fact, we ended up sitting there with, with two sheets of brilliant white light in front of us in place of the windscreen. Passengers aboard the flight also see a strange glow around the plane's jet engines. Smoke begins to seep into the cabin around them. Volcanic ash has been sucked into the aircraft's ventilation system. With ash particles clouding the cabin and the aircraft lit up, the volcanic cloud deals its most deadly blow. Engine failure, number four. Fire action, number four. Checklist. The ash has snuffed out one of the jet's four massive engines. Closed. Start lever. Off. There were huge flames coming out of the back of the engines. 20, some people said 40 feet long. Shooting out of the back of, of all the engines. Is it going to 
penetrate from the outside of the aircraft? Is it going to come into the cabin? Are we going to burn to death? Are we going to choke to death on the smoke? <laughs> Number two, engine's gone. All right, then. Begin the engine shut down. No, wait! They've all gone. All four engines have failed. The other three just went out almost immediately, and that's when it begins to be a serious emergency. A minute and a half, we've gone from four engines running normally to having none. The 747 is suddenly powerless, and it's quickly falling to the sea. Starting the engines has become the crew's only priority. But volcanic ash is making that task impossible. The temperature in the combustion chamber where this ash is flowing through are around 2,000 degrees centigrade. And so the volcanic ash we know melts at about 1,300, 1,400 degrees. The volcanic ash transforms into molten goo within the jet engines. The material blocks key air passages and causes the engines to surge and shut down. We've got a fundamental disturbance of the airflow in the main core of the engine, which caused the engine to backfire. And the engines flamed out, and that was the cause of the problem. Roger, declare emergency. Mayday, 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 Speedbird 9. We have lost all four engines out of 370. Without the engines, the 747 begins to fall from the sky. At an altitude of 35,000 feet, the pilots have less than half an hour before their aircraft will crash into the Indian Ocean. All right, begin restart drill. Set. Battery. Check on. The standard restart drill takes three minutes to complete. Anything? Anything? No. Again. All right, then. From the top. Battery. The crew will have fewer than ten attempts to start the engines. Fire switch. In. British Airways Flight 009's dead engines are having an effect inside the cabin. The engines usually maintain air pressure. Without them, the pressure is dropping. Passengers are having difficulty breathing. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, Breathe normally, but I'm not deep. Stand by. Please. Open. Crossfeed valve. In. Fire switch. Closed. We, we haven't had any success with the drill at all, um, despite all the efforts we were putting in. But it was, it was the only thing we had left to cling on to, so that's what we did. From the top again. Battery. Check on. Stand by ignition on. Start lever on. All right, are we getting something? It's not starting. I knew it was so difficult to land aeroplanes on the sea, even when you had everything going for you. Uh, and I thought that, uh, well, we haven't got much going for us here. I'd never done it before. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We have a small problem. All four engines have stopped. We're doing our damnedest to get in under control. I trust you are not in too much distress. All right, from the top then, battery. Check. On. Stand by power. On. Start level. Well, anything? No. All right then, from the top again, battery. We had very few uh, chances left of starting the engines before having to turn out to, to sea again, because we wouldn't have been able to clear the, the mountains on the south coast of Java. Then, with just 12,000 feet separating British Airways Flight 009 from the ocean, engine number four roars to life. Engine four, back online. The noise that a Rolls-Royce engine makes when it starts up is low rumbling noise, you know, and it was, uh, it, it was just, well, it was wonderful to hear it. The glass now is half full, it's not half empty. We're now in with a, a real chance. And I'll tell you what, the three of us would have dragged that aeroplane round the whole island of Java. Thrust lever, closed. Start lever, cut off. Fuel pressure, uh, available. Standby ignition on. 
start lever on. Engine three, back online. I can't believe it. Engines one and two, both back online. As soon as you came out of the volcanic ash and the engines were not running, remember, so everything cooled down, it was enough for this stuff to break off and allow the engines to restart. We say, right, let's get this thing on the ground as quickly as we can. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We seem to have overcome that problem and have managed to start all the engines. <laughs> Diverting to Jakarta and expect to land in about 15 minutes. British Airways Flight 009 landed safely. No one was injured, and an important lesson was learned. We have learned quite a bit, and we've incorporated this learning into pilot training. Pilots now, for example, know what signs to look for. After British Airways Flight 009's emergency landing in Jakarta, Communications were improved between the geologists who watch volcanoes on the ground and the pilots who must avoid the ash clouds. During the day, they are plainly visible to pilots. And then at nighttime, they're relying a lot on their onboard radars, and that's not going to detect volcanic gas. Anything on the radar? No. So they're completely blind to it, and they just blindly fly right into the, the ash cloud. Today, meteorologists were forced to shut down airspace due to violent thunderstorms and volcanic ash. The weather on the east coast is now clearing and the volcanic plume is starting to thin. We never really seem to get a break uh, where we can sit back and put our feet on the desk and, and relax. There's always something going and there's always the next storm coming down the pipeline and, and we gotta address it. The next storm has begun to appear. Pilots in the Seattle region are calling in with reports of severe turbulence. But we've got two systems actually over the west that we're watching, one over uh, now over central California and what looks like it's a little bit more powerful storm uh, coming onshore into Washington and Oregon. That's certainly going to be our uh, attention getter for the next day and a half. More than a million people got on an airplane on this stormy December day. Some planes were delayed, but there wasn't a single accident due to weather. That's the kind of result these meteorologists hope for every day. Ideally, we'd never have clouds or, uh, or any type of a hazardous weather for pilots and, and everything would be clear skies and smooth sailing. We're here to, to help people be safe and, and when that, that duty calls, we're prepared. We'll, we'll catch our breath today and get ready for tomorrow.